I go hunting in southern Illinois on property that my family owns. The place is practically my second home and I've spent countless hours exploring all around every inch of it. I've caught all the fish in the area, I've hunted every legal game and spotted the rest. So when I say that I've never had an experience like this, remember that this was my domain that I felt comfortable in any weather, at any time, with any equipment or even lack thereof. So two deer seasons ago, I had pulled into the farm at probably about 4.40 in the morning. It was November, so at least two hours till sunlight. I pull my stuff out of the truck and I walk into the woods. I have my shotgun and a revolver knife on my belt, an elbow light clipped to the front of me, a thermos of coffee and a backpack with a book and a couple of other things for cleaning my deer should I get lucky. So I walk off the drive and into the woods. The tree stand that I'm going to is less than a mile away, but through some dense second growth forest and down a rather steep hill, across some bottoms, then a lung burning steep climb up another ridge. I always dread the hike, but it's a good spot, so I often do it. I make it down to the bottoms, slush through the icy muck, and get to the climbing. With my flashlight clipped to my chest, I keep needing to physically turn my body to throw the beam around and see trees that I recognize to determine my path. This, of course, always gives the forest a horror movie vibe, even on the best of days. The leaves and the underbrush are encased in frost, so every one of my steps comes with a solid crunch, no matter how quiet I'm trying to be. This time, though, I noticed that there was more noise than usual. What I mean is that something else was crunching close by, too. I walked about maybe a quarter of the way up the hill listening to my company the whole time, seeming to stay the same distance away as I moved. Naturally, I think to myself that I'm going to have a quick hunting day, so I plop my butt down next to a tree. I can't shoot until first light, but I'm hoping if I stay really still that whatever I'm hearing will lounge around until then. So I click off my light, unsling the shotgun, and I lay it over my knees to wait. Except... I don't really hear anything now. Whatever it was, it must have been spooked by my flashlight spinning all around as I sat. I still stayed a bit sipping some coffee to make sure, but I gave up after 15 minutes or so of dead silence from the forest floor. And I probably didn't even make it four steps before the moving starts again. At this point, I'm still not freaked out. I stay facing the way that I am and I flip the light off again and sidestep behind a tree. And sure enough, I don't hear anything again. Two minutes of sitting there frustrated before I start moving again and my new friend does too. And this is where I started to get a bit nervous because I worked my way up the hill stopping to turn and look every so often. And when I stopped, the sound would go on for just an infinitesimally longer amount of time than my own steps. Like... Something seeing me stop and doing its very best to stop before I heard it. This happened no less than four times as well and by now I'm sweating bullets and freezing cold because, well, it's the middle of winter. I abandoned my thermos near a tree so that I could hold my flashlight and my revolver at the same time and the last hundred feet or so to my stand was done backwards so that I could be facing the noise and in theory keep it from moving. And... I didn't hear anything again after that. I got up into my stand and I smoked like five cigarettes in a row. It gave me a sense of security being up in a tree behind camouflage like that. Still, I only hunted for like an hour of daylight and went back early that day. And I wasn't moving slow headed back to the truck, even with the sun shining bright at this point. Now, I haven't told my family about this because... Well, I don't think that they would believe me, but man, when I think back about it, it was freaky. The sound and when it decided to happen felt, well, very human, which it likely was as poachers and trespassers occasionally wander onto our property. Still, ever since then, when I go hunting, I'm much better about letting people know where I am going and for how long these days. I still don't know what that was, I didn't see anything, which is perhaps the most strange part. I thought that I would have seen something at least, being that the sound sounded so close. In the end, I 
Still have no idea what happened that day, and if you guys know anything about what it could have been, then I would love to hear it. Growing up in the 90s, I was always exposed to a fair amount of aliens in the media. Movies and TV like Independence Day, MIB, Mars Attacks, uh, E.T., X-Files, Invader Zim, ALF, Third Rock from the Sun. I can't remember anyone in my family ever taking any sort of particular interest in aliens, but they were just always sort of, I don't know, around. I don't know if this media is why, or maybe it was my parents' open attitude towards the subject, but I never questioned the existence of them. I knew stories about people being abducted and crop circles, but I didn't feel like it presented any sort of immediate danger. I never considered myself to be afraid of them, and that is until my mum started asking me about it one morning. I've always been a sleep talker, well, more of a sleep mumbler I guess, but... When I was 9 or 10, I started sleepwalking as well. My parents would find me in like the living room or the hallway trying to incoherently accomplish something. Most of the time, they could just guide me back to my bed without incident. But on one occasion, it just wasn't that simple. When my mum came to check on me before she went to sleep, she saw that I wasn't in my bed. She came into the room to look for me and noticed a small figure crouched in the closet. She asked me what I was doing and came closer to help me back to bed. And as she started to approach, I guess that I started crying and mumbling about aliens and I even peed on the floor. She was shocked and called for my dad to come and help her. When he arrived, he tried to pick me up to comfort me, but I started screaming and I hit him in the face apparently. Something that I'd never done before and haven't done again since then. They had to let me cry myself out, mumbling the aliens and don't take me again over and over until I would let them help me. My mum says that she doesn't think that I ever really woke up too because I didn't say anything as she changed my pajamas and tucked me back in. The next morning when she asked me if I had had a dream about aliens, I, I didn't know what she was talking about. I mean, I had no recollection of anything that had happened the night before. She asked if being abducted by aliens was something that I had worried about often and I honestly told her that it just wasn't. But my parents never made a big deal about the occurrence. They just wanted to make sure that I was alright but I, I was pretty embarrassed by it. Since I had no memory of the event I wasn't left with any fear of the aliens while I was awake but I was left with a burning curiosity I guess as to whether they would be back. Nearly two years ago now, my husband and I moved to a pretty safe town. We decided to have some fun while we were young and child free, so we got an apartment downtown. It was super fun. It's on the top of a shopping center with restaurants, boutiques, a theater, all kinds of stuff. We had a blast living there too and have always felt very safe. Now, I like to go on walks. Since the area is so busy, I've always just sort of walked here and there when I'm alone. I go on a walk about every other day, less in the winter. But for two years, I've seen this older man sitting in the shopping center. He always gave me a really bad feeling though, so if I came upon him, I tried to divert my path. But I felt sort of bad for judging, I guess. I said to myself, maybe I was just being paranoid. Maybe he's just old and lonely and wants to be out and around people, right? Well, the other night, there was a, apparently a shooting in the shopping center. It was around 8 o'clock at night, and I never go out that late by myself, so I didn't even know about it until the next morning. It turns out that some older man had kidnapped a woman in the shopping center at gunpoint, assaulted her, and tried to drive away with her even. Her husband drove after them and shot at the guy. She was rescued, and he's apparently now in jail. He admitted to the police that he's been stalking that shopping center for victims, watching the women around there, and I cannot tell you just how many times in the past two years that I have crossed paths with this guy, how many times I felt guilty for feeling uncomfortable around him, how many times I was right in his path, an easy target even. 
I guess the moral of the story is always trust your gut. Always. For some background, I'm a male in my late 20s living in northern Canada. And last weekend, I got a call from a friend telling me that while on his ski trip, he went on by my cabin as it was on his route, and that it looked like someone broke into it and smashed all of the windows. Devastated, I went out to my shed to load up my ski and sled with boards and tarps to repair the windows, hopeful to keep some of the snow out of my cabin until I could probably replace the windows in the spring. And just as I was about to leave, I got this... I don't know, gut feeling that something was wrong and that I should take a rifle just in case, because better to be safe than sorry. As I started my ride into the woods, I noticed the sky getting darker and I thought to myself, great, now I'll have a storm to deal with too. Luckily it wasn't a snowstorm but just a thick fog that rolled in quickly. There's nothing more unsettling too than being alone in the woods like that, encased in a thick fog, especially with God knows what around you. But I finally get to my cabin and sure enough all of my windows are smashed. I unload my gear and get to work, trying to get my cabin secure as fast as I can and get the heck out of there. At some point though, I feel like all of a sudden I'm being watched, which gives me a bit of a lump in my throat because I can't see anything in this fog. Then I hear something moving through the trees. I automatically grab my rifle and put my back to the cabin, hoping that if something comes out of the fog that I'll be ready for it. My first thought was that it was the terrible person who broke into my cabin, coming back under the cover of the fog to see what else they could take. But then I realized that no skidoo approached me as I would have heard one from miles away as it was so quiet out there. After waiting a while with no more noises coming from the woods, I go back to work, get my windows fixed, and I return back to my ski doo to get the heck out of there. After a short ride, I notice something that looks like pot poles in the middle of the trail, and it turns out to be polar bear tracks leading towards my cabin. That creepy feeling of being watched and the noises from the woods was probably a polar bear stalking me, and was the actual culprit of the break-in at my cabin. And what disturbs me most is that, honestly, I, I would never have seen it coming with all that fog that day. And my rifle, well, it would have been practically useless against such a, a huge animal like that. To this day, I genuinely feel lucky to be alive. I really love to drive for DoorDash on my free time. Something about getting out past midnight and just driving is very soothing to me. And why not make some money doing it too, right? Well, and my wife hates it though. Specifically me going out past midnight in what she calls the bad sides of town. I don't see it like that though. I've driven for DoorDash for a bit now and I've never once felt a fear for my own safety, much less a fear for my life, and I love driving on the west side, south side, and downtown around midnight. But let me run through my shift tonight. So I started my dash in at around 5pm to hit the dinner rush and it was slow so I did a lot of waiting for a while. 6pm I started feeling oddly restless, in a way that I haven't felt before. I felt like I needed to get out of my car and run a mile or something, like I just couldn't keep my legs still. I parked at a gas station to walk around and get a soda and a water to calm my nerves, and it worked for a bit. 7pm I drove to the west side, I felt great and was doing really well with how much I was making. No changes in how I did things at all too. It was just a, a very average hour to be honest. The only thing that I did notice was that I was making tons of stupid mistakes. I was missing turns, driving too slow, even stopped at a green light as if it was a stop sign. 8pm I started working the south side, and this is when things got, oh, weird for a lack of a better term. I left the west side with the sun still showing, but by the time that I made it, the sun was completely gone. This was odd too, considering that... I've never noticed it gets so dark so quickly before. 
What I mean is that uh, I drive this almost every day, but this, this was different. It didn't just get dark in a sort of normal way. It got dark normally, but this time I was hyper aware of it, I guess. It's hard to explain, but I just noticed it so much more than before. This is when my anxiety started creeping back. My legs got restless again. I started feeling like I needed to get out of my car and run a mile again. But I brushed it off and continued my work. Although I remained hyper aware of the darkness, and during one order when I was picking up food I could feel it, the darkness was heavy and deep, almost like a low frequency that I just couldn't hear or something, but was sort of vibrating throughout my body. I could feel the heaviness of my heart causing strain on my chest though, and I thought that I could hear it drumming in my ears as well at one point. At 9pm I accepted an order that took me to the western area of the south side, an area and neighbourhood that I've been in hundreds of times before. I stopped my car at the house and something just hit me like a, a ton of bricks. All of a sudden I felt really scared, but not like average fear. There was this absolute sense of complete and total dread that just overtook me. In an instant, I felt like I was being stared at too, and I know it's such a cliche thing to say, but I'm being completely serious when I say that I would have bet all my money that there was someone in the backseat of my car staring at me all of a sudden. I could feel the heaviness almost, just like earlier in the night tonight, sitting in my car in front of this home, I started to tear up a bit as I felt closer to death than I ever have before. I worked up the bravery to turn around, but of course when I did, nothing was in the back seat, besides the darkness that felt really heavy, as if it was made of solid matter. I just cannot explain, though, how physical the darkness of my back seat felt. Like I was staring at a, a person sitting in the back seat, like their weight was being put onto the car, but nobody was there. I got out of my car to try and shake it off, and when I did, I, I saw another car pull up in the driveway of the home. I thought that maybe I could hand it to them and get on my way, but they just sort of sat in their car looking at me, and looking down at the shining light that I could see was their phone. They did this three times before I worked up the bravery, and I walked the order to the door, every step further increasing my sense of absolute horror for some reason. But I dropped it off, took the picture, and rushed to my car. I turned to my left, seeing the person still sitting in their car in the driveway, their face illuminated by their phone, but they were just sort of staring at me. I locked my doors, and I looked in the back seat again. Still nobody there, and it was confirmed due to the light being on from the opening door. But because I locked the door, the light slowly dimmed to darkness again. And the feeling... The feeling this time was heavier than even before. As soon as the darkness of my back seat hit, it was like the car was full of people sitting back there, just staring intensely back at me. I couldn't look away from the darkness. I felt like I was being crushed by the fear and the anxiety. I turned my car around quickly and I drove off, noticing how the person in the car in the driveway was now no longer in the car, which didn't make any sense because... How the heck did they get out of the car so quickly? 9.30 hit and I closed out my shift at this point. I was sobbing in the driver's seat with my inside car lights on as I drove home. My mind was spinning. I was lightheaded. The sense of absolute total horror was gone and in its place was just a, a void. Emptiness. As if something occupied my soul for just a moment and then left it wide open and vacant. I walked into my home. My wife greeted me, noting how I returned early. I fell into her arms and sobbed again. It's now 11pm and I'm sitting on my couch with all the lights on and I just feel utterly alone, empty, completely void of all emotion besides one feeling. A slight semblance of fear sitting in that empty void. My wife wanted me to take out the trash to the dumpster outside but... I just couldn't do it. I don't know why, but I just can't go back outside in the dark tonight. I know that this whole thing is really weird to say the least, but if any of you guys know anything about what might have happened tonight, please do tell me because that fear, 
It's still sitting with me. Around 2014, in a summer in a small provincial town in Ecuador, I was working in my father's farm. He was dedicated to livestock, so every weekend after school, he'd help with daily tasks, such as feeding the cows and go over to them to make sure that they're not missing or have any problems and stuff. Well, one Saturday I did a routine afternoon batch check around 3pm. For some reason I couldn't do it earlier, so I rode my horse called Loco and went to see them in the afternoon. It was a bit of a trip, but it was about 50 minutes to an hour because there was a shortage of pasture on the farm and we had to rent a, a piece of land nearby. The outward journey and the batch check passed without incident. It was around 5.30 in the afternoon, so I started the journey back and... 30 minutes back home I just felt a, a strange I don't know like wind on my body or something I was skeptical until that moment but for some weird reason that feeling made me think something bad was about to happen almost instantly too I noticed that Loco began to struggle with the reins something strange since he was a noble and really calm horse however he began to move his ears abruptly his hair curled and his body struggled against the side of the road, as if, as if to say, I want to dodge something and run. And with all my strength, I tried to control him with the reins while that was happening, and my head involuntarily turned to the right, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a, a black silhouette, maybe a one and a half meters away from us, disappear from the fence that surrounded us and made its way through the undergrowth. The undergrowth began trembling and it was breaking everything when it disappeared. It didn't run, it didn't fly, it simply just sort of vanished. I really don't think it was an animal too since it didn't like make any animal noises or the typical sound when an animal or a person flees. Whatever this thing was it seemed almost supernatural or something. What I mean is that it just sort of vanished in a, a huge rumble of dry undergrowth. While that happened too, in a brief second, my hands went completely numb from the force that I applied on the wheels and Loco simply started running and I, still confused, held on with the little strength that I had left so as not to fall and injure myself. After minutes of intense running, Loco finally stopped his gallop. I went down to drink some water in a stream and it was at this time that I noticed that my eyes began to burn like nothing else. They just burn like having bathed in like pepper spray or something. And I hadn't done or touched anything to make this happen. When I got home and unsaddled my horse, I went inside and my mother asked me almost immediately what had happened to my eyes. I simply replied that it was my sweat, that it wasn't necessary for her to be alarmed that way, but she insisted that I go look in the mirror. And when I did, I noticed that my eyes were like full of blood. Almost like crying blood too. There was not a single white space in my eyes any longer. And there was nothing but two meatballs filled with red as vivid as blood. That obviously scared me and I couldn't help but feel that it was somehow related to that black thing that I saw. It should be noted that my doctor couldn't find a medical or even a logical explanation about what had happened to my eyes and that no medication helped. In fact, my eyes remained that way pretty much for two months. But telling this to my mum and brother, they just froze. My brother went the next day to check the area where I had seen that sighting to have a look around and see if he could find anything. And he told me that there were no trails, roads, or at least one broken branch. Everything was completely clean. It was just really weird and there were no plants there that would cause this... He acquired some water samples for the doctor and they came back negative too. It's been eight years and I remember it vividly and I haven't been back to that place since then. Loco unfortunately died a year ago and it's sad to know that he was my partner and the only one who ever experienced that with me. I miss you Loco. So, I had a date several years ago. I met this dude online and I really should have paid attention to the red flags. 
This guy had no sense of humor and wouldn't even type so much as an LOL or a smiley face when I tried to joke with him. He seemed kind of, I don't know, serious, but he had a lot of intriguing things to say and we had a lot of the same interests, so I figured that maybe he would be a better in person or something. After creepy encounters in the past though, I made sure to message one of my best girlfriends before going out on this date. Told her where we were going and the car that he drove and even his name. I even sent a pic of his profile online. Anyway, I met him at the restaurant that happened to be next to a hiking trail. Weird, right? And well, during our time eating, his sense of humor had not appeared at all. It was pretty creepy to be honest. Like every time that I made a joke or laughed, he would just stop what he was doing and stare right through me. Like staring at nothing. His eyes resembled the cold, emotionless eyes of a, a doll maybe or something. And it just really creeped me out. And then he started talking and it got a lot worse. He started talking about his job and how he felt slighted by everyone and that he deserved to be treated better because he was smarter than them. A serious psychopath red flags were going off in my head at this point. He never even had any emotion on his face either. No smile, no laugh, just a constant blank face and blank stare with those predatory eyes. Then he wanted to go for a hike. I said that I needed to go to the bathroom, told my friend everything via a phone call. She was to make up a story to allow me to ditch the date and I should have just crawled out that window and left but I didn't want to be rude. I don't know, I felt sort of bad. My friend was going to call me in like 10 minutes with her story, but we started down this hiking trail. There were plenty of people around, so I relaxed for a bit. But then he kept trying to take me off the trail to look at a great spot. Apparently he had found one earlier. He had obviously been off the trail here before, and quite frankly, I just panicked. I sent my friend an SOS and she called with the story that her car broke down or something and needed me to get to her. The dude wasn't buying it and insisted on meeting my friend, but we both drove to the restaurant separately, so why would he need to meet my friend? He became frustrated and a little bit angry at this point, the first emotion that I'd ever seen on this guy's face. I rushed back on the trail where I could be seen and the anger on his face just vanished. He decided to stay there where he was on the trail and thankfully didn't see me off when I left. Now, I don't know if this dude was truly dangerous or not, but the feeling that I got in the pit of my stomach told me to just get out of there right now. What do you guys think? Was I just jumping the gun or was there something more going on here? This happened when I was in my early 20s. I was on plenty of fish, looking to meet a nice guy. I had a few conversations going with some people, but they quickly became lewd and then aggressive when I expressed my lack of interest in hookups. But there was one guy who was maybe five years older than me that had messaged me and he was really the only one that didn't act like the others had. But what I mean is that we had normal conversations and I thought, you know, what the heck? He wanted to meet up and we should give it a crack. I was in the Navy at the time and it turned out that he was too. On the same base even. I lived off base mind you but he claimed to be a martial arts instructor that taught classes at the gym by the barracks. And he seemed nice and all so we set up a date but something about him just bothered me that I couldn't put my finger on. I think it was the fact that I'm used to making people laugh and joking around since I'm sort of a bit of a class clown, but with this guy, I just got nothing. He would never respond when I made a joke, just would carry on what we were talking about before. He seemed almost too serious. In the end, I just chose to ignore it because maybe I wasn't as funny as I thought. Anyway, the night before I was to meet him, I got a strange phone call from an unknown number. Like one of those numbers that says unknown or blocked or something so you can't call them back. I wasn't going to answer at first but man 
Am I glad that I changed my mind? So the person on the other end of the phone sounded female and a little bit frantic. She said, uh, Hello? Is this... And my name. And I paused. Uh, who? I answered. She then said, Look, I know that you have a date tomorrow with this guy and I'm telling you not to go. He's a dangerous person. I was kind of startled that she knew my name and the guy's name and I responded with, What? Who are you? And she pleaded for me to hear her out. She said that she was an IT for the Navy, which is how she was able to hack his account and find out messages to each other, including my phone number and everything. She apparently used my phone number to look me up in the base directory or something like that. Found my name and address, or so she claims. That freaked me out a bit. But she then tells me that he lured her somewhere private to try and have his way with her after meeting her on plenty of fish. I asked if she reported it, but she said no because nobody believed her since her rank was low. Now, obviously, I didn't know if this was some sort of psycho ex or if this was real or not, but I wanted nothing to do with either of those things, to be honest. So I thanked her for a time, and I promptly cancelled the date. Look, I don't want any part of either of those things, whether it's a crazy ex or sexual abuse. No thank you, especially since she stalked both him and me at this point. I don't know. Something didn't sit right about that whole encounter and the dude called me the next day and asked why I cancelled. I made something up and he then says the girl's name from the phone call called you, didn't she? I froze because I just didn't know what to say. He then says, I thought so, and then hung up. I blocked his number after that. So first, I, I just want to give some background info. So this happened about four years ago in a house where I lived with my mum and my brother. Uh, my mum and my brother still live there, and an old couple passed away in this house before we moved in. There's a small basement which me and my dad decorated, so it's sort of like my extra room, if that makes sense. And the basement has a separate door from the outside too. So one day, I was just chilling in the basement with my friend watching some movies. When we were home alone, my mum was at work until 8pm. We told her to bring us some snacks when she comes back and it must have been about 8.15pm when we heard the main door of the house opening, steps going from the living room to the kitchen, chairs moving, etc, etc. Normal noises you hear when someone is upstairs. We both heard it and I was like, oh, mum's home and he said, yeah, oh, snacks are here too. A few minutes later, my phone rings. It's my mum, and I was like, okay, probably she's calling us to go and get the snacks. I answer, and she says, I'm stuck at work. We'll be home by 10 p.m. There's a problem with security. I was speechless, and I looked at my friend, and he was sort of shaking too. He heard my mum through the phone, and I had one key to the house. My mum had the other key brother was at grandma's place and nobody else had a key there were only two keys for this whole house so we went upstairs to the main door and it was locked lights out i opened and we searched the house but there was nothing weird just as we left it there were no chairs moved even to the both of us that heard the moving for sure and it gives me chills even thinking about this. I heard a lot of steps and movement upstairs growing up when I was alone in that basement, but didn't think too much of it, since only I heard it. But since my friend heard it too this time, I'm starting to think that everything else that I heard was also true. And not my imagination like I first thought. So this takes place years ago when I was, I want to say like 8 or 9 I think. I was on a holiday with my dad at the time and he taking me out for a walk in the woods to a nearby place that we were staying in. And we'd gotten pretty far in and we saw this guy laying face down on the ground. My dad's first thought was that this guy was dead 
I mean, he wasn't moving and he couldn't tell if he was breathing or not. I remember him putting his arm in front of me though to try and get me away from what he thought was a corpse. My dad starts reaching into his pocket when the guy on the ground gets up and looks at us. Now, not to be rude, but this guy looked completely off his head. He was doing a kind of mixture between smiling and grimacing. He had dark stains in his clothes, which I now think could have been blood. He stands on his feet and stumbles closer and says, You know what you've got now, don't you? This is the first time in my life that I can remember too, where my dad is completely speechless. Just doesn't... The guy then screams, you've got a dead man on your hands and just legs it off into the woods. I don't remember being super terrified, but I was just really confused and a little bit scared. My dad, whenever he tells this story to people, he says that it's the most scared that he's ever been. We immediately left and he called the cops, but apparently nothing ever came of it. They never found the guy at least. I've been to the place since then, but not into the woods, just in case I ever run into that guy again. So my son, who is now 14, told me that when he was outside playing by the pond in our backyard, that it got really quiet. He couldn't hear anything at all, apparently. But then he started to hear music coming from behind the pond. Mind you, this is not in a rural area, Jacksonville, Florida, but the pond backed up to a sort of wooded area, possibly a preserve, I think, and he said that the music played and he followed it to the backside of the pond, and there he met what he described as shadow kids at the time. He said that they didn't talk, but they played with him. He said that they played tag first, then built rock towers. Then he said that they started to play hide and seek and he was the seeker. He saw one and he started to chase it. He said that he tripped over a rock and fell so he stopped because all the other shadows came out and surrounded it. Then two larger shadow people, he described them as being big as the house, came out and sort of scolded him. He said it was a menacing feeling like they were angry and it was his fault. He got scared and ran back into our house. He told me of this whole ordeal, which sounds like it would have taken at least an hour with all of the playing and different games that they played, but he'd only been outside for maybe five minutes while I was putting my swimsuit on because I was going to tan and let him play outside. He was tired and even took a nap after. I didn't discredit his story. He isn't and never has been a liar. And he's always just had this sort of whole Gryffindor Harry Potter persona about him, so I knew that he wasn't making it up. It bothered me a lot though, but I didn't bring it up other than to ask if he had seen them ever again. He didn't, and even said that he wished that they would just come back because they were so much fun to play with. Anyway, a few years later, when he was 10, I asked him if he remembered the Shadow Kids and the music. Older now, he said yes, all of it was real too. I remember playing with them for hours and you weren't even worried about me. I thought that I was going to be in big trouble when I got back, but I was just having so much fun. We talked about it a little and what they looked like and stuff, and he told me that they were like shadows, but also sort of smoke. They weren't black, they were more transparent, but also able to be seen. He said that it's hard to describe, but the closest thing that he can think of is like mist or smoke. Now, I've heard all of these crazy encounters, and couldn't believe the similarities, the silence, the music playing, the transparent figures, the loss of time. Yesterday was my first time reading into this and I've been hooked because of my son's personal experience. I just asked him if he remembered and he had first tried to do the whole, mom it was probably just temporary schizophrenia or something because it embarrasses him now I guess. But when I told him that I was asking because a bunch of people have had the same thing happen to them, he eased up a bit and started talking about it. He said that the music wasn't scary, that it was nice in fact. He again described the misty smoky transparency of the shadow kids and how much the big ones scared him. This time he added that it was dark when he ran home and he went to bed. I'm not sure if that was what he experienced at the time or his memory for being scared made him think that it was dark. 
but he did go straight to sleep, so I remember that bit. But it was definitely a sunny afternoon in the Florida summer, so I don't know about that. But we were also of German ancestry. My grandfather was full German. His parents immigrated to the US from Luxembourg. My son was six years old when this happened, and we moved to a new home a few weeks after this experience, and thankfully it just never happened again. Now, that was obviously all strange enough, but the year before my son's encounter, I was asleep in my bedroom with my Boston Terrier, Delgado, and in the middle of the night, I woke up because I heard a loud crack. It sounded like as if a large piece of plywood were to fall into a tile floor or something. In any case, I sat up and so did my dog. My bedroom was shaped in a sort of way where the doorway is sunken in and kind of the shape of the state of Alabama. If Alabama had all straight edges with the southwest corner of the state being where my bedroom door was. Anyway, I looked towards my door because I was going to get up and see what fell. My husband was on the couch in our living room playing video games on the other side of the wall. It was a small 900 square foot apartment and I could hear the TV. And I'll be if when I looked towards the door I saw someone standing there. I tried to adjust my eyes because my room was pretty dark. My bedroom window was large but it was facing a wooded area so there wasn't any moonlight or lights of any kind. My eyes eventually focused and I could tell that it was a man. I said my husband's name thinking that it was just him trying to scare me. I didn't get any answers though. This man stepped out of the doorway and that's when I realized that it wasn't anyone that I knew. It was a person and this person was at least seven feet tall. Looked like a guy wearing normal clothes and a hat but maybe a baseball cap? It was so dark but it was definitely a person and my dog saw it too and he started growling instantly. That's when the good old cliche overwhelming sense of dread came over me too and it was like it just poured over me like water. I went from being curious to just full on adrenaline pumping. The dog was the confirmation that I needed to snap me into survival mode though. My thoughts were going a thousand miles per hour. I darted my gaze to our bathroom door which was also shut and I knew that I couldn't book it in time before this guy closed in. I had nothing near me that I could use as a weapon and this guy was so big that he was taking up all the space in front of my closed bedroom door. The dog stood up next to me and started barking like crazy and I did the only thing that I could manage and that was to start shouting. I screamed, who are you? What are you doing in my room? No answer. He just stepped in closer. His arms were bowed and he was sort of hunched forward like he was coming to strangle me. As he inched forward though, the thought crossed my mind that my husband hadn't responded to me yelling and the dog barking yet. And the fact that this person had somehow gotten past him undetected was a physical impossibility. I immediately thought that this tall freak was someone that broke in to kill us and that he had gotten to my husband first and I was next. I wasn't going down without a fight though and I remember thinking that he's going to have to overkill me because I'm not going to go down like this. I started screaming for anyone that could possibly hear me. The man is silent and still getting closer. I'm sizing him up now and thinking that maybe if he gets close enough I can kick him and run out the door. I realized that the way that I was sitting wasn't going to be a good position for that so I started to adjust myself all while screaming. When suddenly there's light. My husband, my saving grace, comes tearing through the door and turns on the light. He's yelling, what's going on? Who is it? Frantically looking around the room. And I tell you no lies when I say that this giant seven foot tall scary serial killer just evaporated right in front of my eyes. It wasn't like the lights turned on and nothing was there. This thing just slowly dissipated right in front of me. I watched it fade away just like you would see a ghost in a movie, but it was more 3D. Sort of like water mist, if you've ever been to a, a water park or a theme park where they have those misters that cool you off. It had on what looked like normal clothes, like a shirt and jeans. I remember either the hat or the shirt looked sort of orange, but he had no face. It 
was maybe two feet away from me too, hand stretched out like it was about to grab me and I could see my husband through it and then just all of a sudden it was gone. Obviously, I've never been so shook in my entire life. I was shaking and crying and my husband was just so confused. He thought that I had just had a bad dream. Our neighbor called the police too because of my screaming and had to tell the cops that I had a nightmare. To this day, I know too that I wasn't asleep. I know the difference between half dreaming and being asleep and dreaming. Dogs can't see your dreams either. I was so scared that night that I shook uncontrollably for like hours. I've literally never been that terrified to the point that I couldn't stop trembling which has never happened, and I've had a rough life with plenty of scary real-life happenings. I couldn't sleep all night, and I didn't fall asleep by myself for years after this. The strange thing is that whatever my son saw that day, it sounds a lot like this. So I'm 23 male and live in California, and last year I decided to use Tinder for the first time. I had previously used Hot or Not and plenty of fish, but mostly just got bots and scammers, so I already wasn't very big on online dating. However, I was feeling bored one Friday afternoon, so I decided to install it and just see what happened. After creating an account, I began swiping people, and it wasn't more than like half an hour after I'd gotten off the app that... I got matched up with someone. For a little context, I am what you might call bisexual. I hate labels, but that's what I fall under, I suppose. And I matched up with a 25-year-old dude named Aiden. Aiden was what I would call attractive, and he had similar interests in gaming and coding as I did. I decided to go and send him a message, but before I could even type a single letter, he sent me a message. The message read, hey, I saw you're new to Tinder and thought that I would reach out and say hi. I said hi back and the two of us began talking about our love for video games, movies and coding. He told me that he's a full-time coder and makes a salary only working four hours a day. He asked me if I'd be down to come and chill with him and I then offered him over to my house because I was alone and he lived with his parents. He seemed very excited about this all of a sudden and said that he would love to come over. We agreed on him coming over in like an hour or so so that I could tidy up my room and get my PC ready for gaming and stuff. After about an hour or so, I sent him my address and he said that he was on his way. Now, normally I wouldn't have invited someone to my house like this that I'd never met, but this guy seemed harmless for the most and he was attractive, so I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. I heard a knock at my door and I looked out the peephole and saw that it was Aiden. He had a bottle of red wine in his hand and a smile across his face and we hadn't discussed drinking wine together but I did in fact like red wine and the brand that he had with him just so happened to be my favorite brand. I opened the door and greeted him. I told him that the wine was actually my favorite and asked if he was a mind reader and he laughed and said that I just strike him as a red wine kind of guy. I asked him how he planned to get home if he ended up drinking too much and he said that he Ubered to my house and we ended up having a couple of glasses of wine on my back patio, just talking about life, work, and shared our coming out stories and stuff like that. After the wine, we went inside to play some PC, and we had a blast. After the gaming, he showed me his laptop, which he brought with him, and showed me all of his work and stuff. Eventually, I had to use the restroom, so I excused myself. I then heard him approach the bathroom door and turn the knob. But because I didn't lock the door behind me, he just sort of came right in completely unannounced. And without any warning, he just starts grinding on me from behind while forcefully grasping my shoulders. I shoved him off of me and just kind of jokingly said, that's a bit intrusive. He just smiled at me and said, I just wanted to see how you would react. I left the bathroom and walked into the kitchen with him walking right behind me. I asked him if he wanted more wine or maybe some water, but... Before I could grab the water bottles from the fridge, this dude pushed himself up against me and groped me and he was just smiling super creepily. This time I was completely taken aback so I shoved him off forcefully and yelled at him. 
I told him that we had just met and that I didn't think that this was the right time to just jump into something like this and he said that it was just a waste of time and said that I had no idea what I was doing and that I give gays a bad name and then said I was being homophobic and I told him that if I was homophobic that I wouldn't be hanging out with him and talking about the things that we were. I told him that I found him attractive but that he was crossing major boundaries at this point. He just laughed and said, in the LGBTQ community, there are no boundaries. And then, just like that, he said that he had to go. And thank God is what I thought to myself. I walked him to the front door and he walked out without saying goodbye or anything. I didn't think anything else of it and decided that I just needed to take a shower. I got in the shower and about five minutes into my shower, I keep hearing this sort of tink tink sound coming from the other end of the door. I peek out through the sliding door of the shower and look down toward the bottom of the door and to my shock I see Aiden holding a freaking spoon to the bottom of the door looking at it at me while I'm showering. I could only see this because of how high off the floor the door sat but not knowing what to do now I just pretended not to notice him and slowly turn the shower off. I got out, wrapped a towel around my waist and prepared to confront him by yanking the door open but before I could do that, I heard him snap a picture with his phone. I flung the bathroom door open and he flew down the hall and out my front door. I saw him get into a white Honda Civic and drive away. He had lied about taking an Uber for some reason and I have no idea what the heck he took a picture of me for or why he took it in the first place but... I can imagine that it wasn't for anything good. I immediately blocked him on Tinder and was paranoid that he would return, but thankfully he didn't. So, that's my story of the Tinder creep who groped me in my own house. So sleeping in a car is definitely not always the best. And I have two different encounters where I thought that I was about to enter the nightmare of my life. So the first one, I was camping about an hour from Santa Fe on a weeknight. It was cold, I was supposed to leave early in the morning for Texas and it was forecasted to snow. But being the young genius that I was, I slept in my jeeps in a gate all these. Middle of the night, an SUV quite literally skids to a stop across the gravel into my campground. This wakes me up and I'm obviously on edge now. This SUV is blasting mariachi music. Incredibly odd, but I figured these people were just drunks or they were high or something. The doors open and these people get out and start running through the woods screaming bloody murder. What I mean by this too is these people sound like they're going to die. I am at an absolute utter loss and maybe a minute or two passes and everything just gets suddenly quiet and I don't hear them anymore. Tucked into my sleeping bag, I'm pretty terrified. I'm sitting there, cramped up in the back of my jeep, wishing and praying them away. And I don't know how long it was, but I dared not look at my phone. Eventually, though, I heard quiet voices around my jeep. The only thing that I caught was... Do you think somebody is in there? And as you can imagine, I absolutely lost my cool. I started screaming and crawled as fast as I could to the front seat where I turned the lights on and the key on the ignition. As I looked up, I see these people scattering away like roaches into the trees and down the mountainside. And ever since, I keep a J-frame revolver in my center console whenever I travel. My state's permit is actually recognized in a lot of places, so it's a nice luxury to have, especially when encounters like this happen. The second story is that this was in the city of Little Rock in Arkansas. I was heading to Oklahoma from the East Coast to visit family for Christmas. I was too cheap to pay for a hotel, so I got off on I-40, parked behind a hotel, and I slept in my Jeep middle of the night, I get woken up by the sound of a small scraping noise though. Confused, I open my eyes to see a figure outside, attempting to work the zipper on my soft top. Horrified, I simply sat there, 
and it wasn't until he or she managed to stick their hand through the small opening that they had created that I reached out, grabbed the nearest thing to me, which was a Coleman lantern, and smashed their hand with it. Without waiting to see the result of this, I jumped into the front seat, worked the ignition, and peeled out of that hotel parking lot faster than I think I ever left anywhere. I didn't stop for gas, red lights, breakfast, or anything. I emerged straight onto the I-40 and continued west for almost 30 miles, and needless to say, that was the last time that I ever slept in my Jeep. So, around 9 or 10 years ago now, I was living with my mum, dad and older sister in an oldish house in a very small village. And like, when I say small, I mean its only main feature was a small church and a few scattered houses occupied mostly by very old people and that was it. At the time, it was the summer, so I wasn't at school or anything, and since we were so far in the middle of nowhere, I spent most of that time at home, glued to one screen or another. The usual routine was I'd wake up around maybe 10 or 11 or something, but by this point, mum, dad, and sister had all left for work, so I had the house to myself. I'd go downstairs, make some toast, watch some random stuff on TV for an hour before heading back to my room to continue with whatever game I was grinding through that particular day. The usual habits of a 17-year-old guy cut off from the world by many, many fields. Anyway, I probably should give a, a quick rundown of our house. It was an older cottage with two rooms upstairs, mine and my sister's, and everything else downstairs. As you walk up the stairs, you go to a very small landing, and you could go sort of either left to my room or immediate right to my sister's room. Basically, the way that this was laid out was that I could sit in my room with the door open, and my sister's room is directly opposite. I should also mention too that the ceilings in both of our bedrooms were slanted. We were basically in a large attic where the roof slanted down, and because of where the slant met the wall, we had the crawl space that ran the length of the house on either side of the rooms, both with a small door to access them. These were mostly used for like storing normal attic stuff, like Christmas decorations and old forgotten toys, stuff like that. The doors to these were thin little things, about four feet tall with a small handle on the outside. This is important too because turning these tiny doorknobs opened them, but only from the outside. What I mean is that if the door was pushed shut with you inside, there was no way back out. I discovered this myself on more than one occasion. The door on my side ran along my room and along one wall in my sister's room and hers ran along the other side along my room. This space was not very big too. You had to sort of crouch to stand in it and most of the time you were in there you were crawling on hands and knees. This is all important too, I promise, but anyway, this one morning I'm awoken to a familiar noise, some sort of small creature rustling around in the crawl space on my sister's side. I could hear this because my bed was against the wall that ran along it. Not an unusual noise too. Living in the countryside, we had mice almost constantly, and they pretty much had the run of the storage spaces, no matter how many traps you put in it. I didn't think too much of it, and I got up and went off to begin my morning ritual of toast and television. But the first odd thing that I noticed was, while watching TV, I swear that I could hear movement upstairs. My sister's room was directly above the living room, so I assumed that she had just not gone to work that day or something for whatever reason and continued munching. Anyway, around maybe an hour or two later, I went back upstairs and booted up my PC. As I was waiting, I turned around to my open door and faced my sister's closed one and realized that it was late in the day and she had yet to leave her room which was an odd thing for her since normally she was parked up on the sofa in the living room on her days off and didn't move until her parents returned. We're definitely not the most active family. So I started to think that maybe she was at work and I'd imagine the noise from upstairs. But as I mused this over, I noticed the crack of light at the bottom of her door as a shadow passed by it. Okay... So there's definitely somebody in there, so it must be her, right? 
I once again pushed it off my mind and went back to my PC. More time passed and the thought came back to me. Why would she be at home but not leave? She only had a small TV in her room and no books, so what had she been doing in there all day? I glanced back around and again saw a shadow under the door. She was still moving around in there, so what was up? I finally decided to just go and knock on her door. I knocked a few times and said her name, but there was no answer, which was weird. But maybe she had headphones on or something? I knocked a bit harder again and said her name again, but louder this time. Again, no answer. All right, I thought. You know what? Screw this. I'm just going to go in. So I cracked the door open and peered around. But the weirdest thing is that I found an empty room. No one inside at all. Feeling slightly confused now, but better that it was just my imagination, I stepped in properly and looked around and saw something that really made me go into a full panic. Near the bottom of the little door leading to the crawl space, there was a small hole that the mice had made to get in and out of the bottom. A really small, but just big enough to sort of fit half of your hand through. And there, coming through that hole, were four fingers holding the door shut from the inside. At first I thought, no, that can't be fingers, don't be stupid until I watched them slowly creep back and forth through the hole into the crawl space. And man, did I lose it. Very quietly though, I might add, I backed out of the room, shutting the door behind me and ran to my room. Being the stupid teenager that I was, I grabbed what might be the most imposing weapon that I could find, the fake Winchester rifle cap gun that I got from Disneyland a few years previous. I figured that if whoever was hiding in that bedroom didn't believe that it was a real firearm, I could at least hit them with it. So I ran off downstairs to where my dogs were on the far side of the house and called my mum. She worked about a five minute drive away from her house. She told me to stay put and that her and her manager were on their way. And in this time, I made a small upgrade from the plastic rifle to one of my dad's golf clubs. I felt much better with that too. Finally, my mum and her boss, John, turn up, and I tell them everything leading up to this point. They say okay, and we all set off upstairs to investigate, and me rather unheroically bringing up the rear with my golf club. I'll never know if my mum is just hard as nails or massively stupid, but while John and I watched, she marches over to the door, yanks it open, and sticks her head in. A moment passes while she looks left and right, and John and I are preparing to yank her back from the clutches of the psycho hobo murderer hiding in there, before she shouts, Chris, what are you doing in there? Get out. Small amount of backstory, Chris was actually my sister's boyfriend, and unbeknownst to me, the night before, my dad had asked Chris to leave as he had stayed with us for like around five days at this point. He said yes, and well, that's cool, and as far as mum and dad knew, he had headed home. But what really happened was, instead of leaving, him and my sister had planned to make it seem like he had left and then he could stay another night. He then would wake up before my mum shouted my sister up for work, like she did every morning, and would hide in the crawl space and sleep there until everyone had left for the day. The one small hitch in that plan is that they did not think of, you guessed it, me. They'd forgotten that I was home and conveniently sat directly opposite the only exit for the house of the day, so he was trapped. When I knocked, he hid himself behind the door and held it shut to prevent being locked in. Anyway, my mum swiftly told him to get out and not come back. Sadly, this was not the last time we saw that guy too, as it turned out he'd stolen quite a bit of money from my sister's room while he'd been hiding out, and then, because my sister makes terrible decisions got her pregnant and proceeded to smash windows trying to get at her and the baby around a year later. So he was a pretty nasty guy. For a while too we lived in the same city when I went to uni and he was spending time at the prison there for apparently stabbing someone in a completely different town. So yeah, super guy. Oh and um, a small topper to all of this is that, as I mentioned earlier, the only rooms upstairs are mine and my sister's bedrooms. 
He'd been in there for like close to 14 hours with no access to a toilet. But don't worry, because this guy, he had lots of empty bottles, which he kindly left behind for us to clean up. And finally, around a year later, as Mum was getting the Christmas decorations out, which were at the far back of the storage space, she found a small bag filled with feces. I should mention too, where she found it is exactly next to where my bed is on the other side of the wall, and the rustling that woke me up that day, it was him, hiding his excrement amongst our tinsel and tree. Anyway, he was a really bad dude and I'm just glad that nobody got hurt in the end because I sometimes wonder what he would have done to me if I had found him in the house alone that day in the crawl space. As a kid, I used to live in an old home in the suburbs of Perth, Western Australia. But the home was built in 1939 and I believe that it was a war housing for vets after the Second World War. It was laid out in two sections in any case. My parents bought the house in 2000. The original home was at the front of the house which was quite small, creaky wooden floorboards and high ceilings. There was only like three rooms too. In my room, my sister's room and a playroom, this part of the house was where a lot of the activity was centred. A hallway connected the old house to what was originally the backyard, but had been renovated to add a large modern wing onto the existing structure, and my parents' room was in this wing. So I lived there until I was around 12 years old, and my experience begins at, I would say, around 5 or 6. I'd started to hate sleeping in my room and being in that part of the house in general. Every time that I was there, I just felt really uneasy, even during broad daylight and I just had no idea why. I was just suddenly overwhelmed with panic every time that I crossed the threshold into the old wing by myself. Activity was usually focused in the toy room, the biggest room in the part of the house. Small things like toys moving and going missing, turning on in the middle of the night when they were switched off hours prior, stuff like that. The first experience must have been when I was around five. I had a vivid night terror of a dirt-covered black glove reaching out from under my pillow and attempting to grab me. When I told my parents, they seemed just well, pretty unbothered by it, although now I know that this wasn't the case. Uh, this comes into play later. When I was around seven, though, I remember a Barbie keyboard my sister had turning on and playing some sort of tune late at night. My sister woke me up, as any kid would, and we both went and woke up our parents. When they heard what was happening, they were visibly on edge, as this was not at all the first experience that they'd had with that room. After some apprehension, my dad went in and turned the keyboard off. The ceiling light wouldn't turn on, and it worked in the morning, so it was just a really weird night. A separate occasion involving toys happened in my room. I was around 8 years old, and I had a 2008 Mummy's Gold Matchbox toy set. If anyone is unfamiliar with it, it's a battery-powered track which, once a matchbox car runs over a button or the button is pushed, it activates mummy's eyes to glow and a voice line, I've got you now, to play in that sort of typical 2000s scratchy audio. Anyway, I was just having trouble sleeping late one night. I was wide awake, so it wasn't some half-sleep hallucination thing, but... The I've got you now broke the silence and I jolted up to look at the track. Its arms were moving up and down repeatedly and it was a functionality that the toy just didn't have. Its arms were only meant to move up and down once and after a few seconds it just stopped. Now, I'd been playing with it earlier and I definitely remember switching it off. Obviously, I, I didn't sleep well that. In fact, I started sleeping on the couch in the living room after this. I can recall multiple occasions in which a clock would fall off the wall, no matter where it was placed to or what we used to hang it. It just fell off every time. The activity, though, was fairly quiet for the remaining couple of years that we lived there. Basic sort of stuff like bangs and scratching noises, a cold breeze when there were no windows or doors open, dogs barking at doorways and corners when there's nothing there but it was nothing to write home about. 
and we moved out in 2013. It's only years later too that my parents told me about their experiences. They're now divorced and they rarely agree on anything, but this is one thing that they both see eye to eye. So the toy room that used to be my sister's room when she was a baby, and the usual toy room stuff applies here. The baby monitors, recording sounds of lullaby players which has no batteries in it or was put away in a closet only to be mysteriously attached to the crib again before being found halfway across the room in the morning. But by far the most disturbing account is that of a dark figure. You see, both my parents experienced waking up in the dead of the night only to see a tall dark figure around six plus feet tall wearing a trench coat and standing over the other person as they sleep. The figure was always gone after a blink, and they each only saw it once, years apart, but it makes them uneasy just talking about it. Though it's not directly a first-hand experience, it definitely helps corroborate my experiences, because the part that terrifies me is their recount of its gloves. Both of them recall it wearing black, dirty gloves, just like the ones that I'd seen in my night terror as a child all those years ago. This happened seven years ago while I was living in a small town in Illinois. My youngest was a few weeks old, so I was up frequently to feed him, so I slept downstairs with him while my husband and older two children slept upstairs. I was woken up to someone knocking on my door one night. I was sort of half asleep and my only thought was getting to the door before it woke everybody up. I was so sleep deprived too that I just wasn't thinking straight. Otherwise I probably wouldn't have answered the door so late at night. But anyway, as I was heading to get to the door, my baby started to wake up so I brought him with me. I opened the door and a man is standing there. I said, how can I help you? And... He just sort of stands there for a second and doesn't say anything. At this point, I'm starting to wake up enough to be observant, and I remember feeling like he seemed nervous, which made me anxious too. All he said was, I'm sorry, I thought you ordered a pizza. Then he grabbed a box off of the table on the porch and walked away. I don't remember what I even said to him, to be honest. I just closed the door and stood there feeling a bit strange thinking about how weird it was but I told myself that he just had the wrong house I think. As I'm walking back to the living room I saw the clock and it was at this point that my stomach dropped. It was a little over 2am but there were no places around that deliver that late. I went back to look outside but I didn't see anyone and there were no cars on the street. I made sure all the doors were locked uh, along with the windows that night and I just remember sitting there a little shaken thinking about how off the situation felt. I mean, one, normally a pizza guy just says hi and tells you how much you owe. All he said was, I'm sorry, I thought you ordered a pizza. Two, the box was not with him. I didn't see it until he grabbed it off the table as he exited my porch. The table is a few feet away from the door if he was holding it, I probably wouldn't have asked how could I help him and I would have just said wrong house or something. Three, I don't remember him wearing anything associated with a pizza place or a name tag. The only place nearby was a pizza hut as well. This was around March or April, so it's possible he had a jacket on, I suppose, but I just don't remember. And four, nothing was open that late and I'm definitely sure about that. The nervous vibe that I got from him too still tells me that something was really off that night. I mean, what was he doing? And if he did have bad intentions, I think either he saw that I had dogs or maybe, maybe me holding my baby changed his mind. Whenever I think about it though, I, I still get chills and I feel lucky that nothing happened that This happened about eight years ago in my local supermarket. I, female, 36 at the time, 
am in the queue to pay. It's a Saturday morning, super busy, and I'm second in line. In front of me at the till is a family of three, mom, dad, and daughter. Mom and dad are unpacking the trolley, and the daughter is sitting in the trolley, just facing me. Behind me are two men, and they're just making me super uncomfortable, standing way too close to me. You know how you can sort of feel someone before you see them? Well, it was a lot like that. I was facing the daughter, and she looked super uncomfortable too, making herself smaller and kept looking over her shoulder to her dad. I turn around, and these men are waving and smiling, trying to get her attention. Then the one guy reaches around me and touches her foot. He did it in such a familiar way too that I thought that he must know the family. She flinched away though and he does it again. She quietly says daddy. Dad swings around and says in a booming voice something along the lines of what are you doing dude? Don't touch my daughter. This weirdo is like but we want to be friends. Dad is like I don't know you back off. I realize then that they don't know each other at all and instantly go into mummy mode. Dad goes back to unpacking the trolley and I position myself between the two guys and the daughter, completely blocking access. Believe it or not too, he tries to get her attention again so I say really loudly, you're so lucky that you have such a brave and strong daddy, look how he's protecting you from these bad men. The dad looks at me and we have a sort of silent conversation with her eyes and they pack up and leave quickly. I thought that it was over, the girl was safe, and as I'm unpacking my trolley, I suddenly notice that one of the men has moved around and is standing at the end of the till, where you pack your groceries into the bags, staring at me with just what I can only describe as pure malice. The other guy is still standing behind me in the queue, my trolley between us. I won't lie, in that moment... I felt intimidated, terrified. I'm not a small woman by any means. I'm tallish with pretty broad shoulders and quite strong. My trolley is 15 kilos of dog food. My adrenaline is pumping. I need to show these guys that I'm not an easy target. I make eye contact with the aggressor at the end of the till and I lift this bag of dog food up like it's just a roll of toilet paper. My facial expression doesn't change, no strain, no tension, just deep and dark. He keeps eye contact with me and now I'm just angry. The fear is gone. I pay and he blocks my exit from the till. I bump him light with my trolley and he laughs sort of menacingly and moves out of the way. I decide not to go straight to my car and instead I walk around the mall a bit and every time that I turn around, they're there. Now with a third guy too. They're not even hiding the fact now that they're following me. The one guy makes a motion of cutting my neck and at that point I start making my way to the security desk. When I get there and turn around they're obviously gone. I tell security everything and they recommend that I let the supermarket know as well. Give them my till number so that they can review the security tape above the till. A guard escorted me to my car and... I drove home the long way, checking my rearview mirror constantly that day. I never did see them again, but to be honest, I just stopped going to that supermarket altogether after that. Partly because of that, but mainly their prices are not competitive and my dogs become fussy eaters too. Anyway, I don't know really what that was all about that day, but something in me says that maybe I stopped a kidnapping or something. When my friend and I met the woman that we now refer to as the Banshee, it was about 10 at night. We were walking back from a milk tea place and we were maybe at mile 5 of a 6 mile total round trip, almost home. We were walking on a long stretch of sidewalk next to a wide road that is busy during the day, but almost empty at night. Also, before I get to this next part, here's a little bit of background. My hiking buddy and I sometimes go for long walks through town at night, when we can't get out to the trails during the day that is. It's dark but our routes go through a fairly safe blend of residential and shopping areas and stuff like that. Usually we head to some sort of late night restaurant or food truck, where we walk, stop for a drink and a bit of food and then we head back. 
We also wear glowing vests, battery powered, and reflective stuff to make sure traffic sees us because we've had some too close encounters with distracted drivers before. But we've also had a few encounters with, well, let's just call them strange people. Anyway, she didn't start making strange noises at first. It was a long stretch of straight sidewalk and we had seen her coming for a long time before she started that. No one else was out walking along the road that hour. There were plenty of street lights and she would sort of appear under the street light and then disappear in some shadow of bushes and trees and reappear under the lights again. We were obviously glowing in our vests in addition to the street lights, so she had to have seen us coming too. I figured that she worked at one of the shops or the restaurants nearby and was getting done with closing up. I figured that she was just trying to get home, just like we were, I suppose. That is... Until she started making these, what I can only describe as just random noises. The first sounds were like uh, an odd hacking noise, like she was attempting to clear her throat as noisily as possible. But this was just a warm up. The sound changed to something like a, a cross between a crow cawing and a small dog's bark. Retelling the sound is a little bit hard, but that's the closest thing that I can think of. Anyway. We kept walking towards her, watching and listening, thinking perhaps she has a disability or some other issue. She looked decently dressed and she walked steadily and deliberately, not like someone on drugs. If not for her noises too, she seemed completely normal. But then she made these loud but low-pitched groaning sounds. It had us briefly making zombie movie references, joking a bit, but we speculated that if she was maybe talking to someone on her earbuds or making an attempt at singing something. But it got weirder as she added some higher pitched screechy sounds, something like an angry cockatoo might make. At this point she's less than two blocks away and she's rotating through these bizarre sounds with short pauses of silence between them. To be honest though, she looked like someone's cute little grandma. She didn't look anything like something you would expect to be making these sounds. She's wearing an old fashioned thick skirt, a cardigan and clunky looking shoes, carrying a single cloth shopping bag. Her hair is a short curly old lady perm and honestly she just looks adorable, but she sounds insane. She's getting closer too, her bizarre noises are getting more unsettling and I realize that I can't actually see what she's clutching in her other hand, the one that doesn't have a shopping bag. She looks harmless, but the sounds are just too weird. My buddy looked at me and asked, time to cross, echoing my own thoughts. We didn't want a confrontation with this woman. I nodded, but just before we step out onto the road, the lady seemed to have the same idea. She suddenly veered off the sidewalk and went into the road, making a steady diagonal line towards the other side. There was no traffic on the road at this point, so I wasn't really worried. I relaxed a bit, continuing on. I figured that she was avoiding us, just like we were about to avoid her. But just as we started to pass her, she suddenly screamed and just rushed at us from the middle of the road. Her mouth was wide open as she charged at us, just shrieking. We stepped quickly apart and her abrupt rush took her straight between us, just shriek wailing that horrible sound. It sounded like it would hurt her throat to be honest. Banshee like is the only word that I have for it. But we were several feet apart, both braced for her to come back and do something, but instead she just veered again and went down the sidewalk the way that she had originally been going. As she walked away, she kept looking back at us and keeping up short bursts of the shrieking banshee noises, stopping to take breaths. As she got further away from us, she started core barking at us again and we just stood there for a while, silently watching until she was a good long ways off down the sidewalk with her very strange crow barks fading into the distance. To this day, I still have no idea what was wrong with that lady. Did our lights somehow trigger an episode? I, I don't know, but I hope she's okay. She seemed to know where she was going, so we didn't follow her or do much about it. But man, that was a freaky night, that's for sure.
This story starts when I was in middle school. I met this guy who his name was Chase. And Chase was the new kid in my 7th grade English class. He looked like a, a typical skater sort of BMX type kid. Long floppy Justin Bieber style hair and wore shirts and hats that had the monster logo on them. Insert Kyle meme reference. But for the first week or so, we didn't really talk or interact with each other. At lunch, I would always see him just eating alone in the cafeteria. I would just watch him sometimes. His mannerisms and things that he would do were just intriguing to me for some reason. One day though, I was coming out of the bathroom when I see him harassing some 6th grade girl and trying to get her to make out with him. In my stupid, naive 7th grader brain, it didn't really register to me that what he was doing was really wrong. I actually thought that he was cool for doing it. I know, stupid. But he looked over at me, smiled, and then walked away after the girl walked back into her classroom. The next day in my English class was when we first began interacting with each other too. I had to do a book report on Of Mice and Men. When he saw me reading the book, he gave me his notes and told me to just copy his work, but change it up a bit so as to not make it obvious that I'd copied him. He said that the reading was really boring and that he just skimmed through the plot of the book and movie on Wikipedia instead of actually reading the book. I thanked him and was genuinely thankful as I too didn't like reading and I actually love that book now, but... Anyway, that's another story. Eventually, though, we would start hanging out outside of class and would have lunch together outside in the quad. He told me that he was interested in riding BMX bikes and motocross, so my earlier assessment of him was right, I suppose. I wasn't really into that stuff, so I just nodded my head and tried to act like I was genuinely interested in what he was saying. The whole time he'd talk, I'd just admire him for some reason, but... I'm not gay or anything for the record, never have been attracted to dudes, so it was really weird being so drawn to him the way that I was, I suppose. Anyway, we started hanging out after school. He would come over my house every day, and at this point he had completely won my mother over. He would always compliment her on the way that she had the house decorated. He would compliment her cooking and would talk to her about the show Teen Mum 2, which my mum really liked to watch, and apparently so did Chase. Over time, I started going over to his house too. I wasn't as outgoing as he was, so I didn't immediately hit it off with his family, but they were nice people, and I really liked them. But Chase would always argue with his mum, though. And one time, she told him and I to go outside and hang out because she didn't want us playing Grand Theft Auto all day. This seemed to really tick Chase off too, and he turned around and hurled the controller at her, cracking her right in the forehead. I was obviously sent home, and as I was walking down the driveway, I could hear him screaming at his mother and calling her all kinds of horrible things that I won't even repeat here. But the next day at school, he walked up to me at my locker and apologized for what happened at his house. I asked him if his mum was alright after being hit with the controller, and he said that she ended up going to the ER to get stitches. He then said, too bad I had to do that just to get her to shut up. As more and more time progressed, I had started spending more and more time at his house. His attitude towards me started to change too. He would ridicule me for the clothes that I would wear. I always wore black band t-shirts. And he would call me names, like, every day. One night, when I was spending the night at his house, he said that he wanted to play a game. The game was just called Hide and Seek Tag in the Dark, and apparently, he was it. So the first round we turn off all the lights in the house and I hide while he counted. Keep in mind this was his idea, not mine. I thought that it was weird that we were even playing this given our ages at the time. Nevertheless, I find a hiding spot in the crawl space under the staircase and I wait patiently. The house was pitch black and completely dead silent. And let me tell you that the atmosphere in the house was something straight out of a horror movie. I felt extremely uneasy and the hairs of my arms started to stand up. I really couldn't hear a thing in that house and all of a sudden out of nowhere I hear this creepy laugh coming from outside the crawl space door. The door was cracked open and I could see Chase peeking in. He says in a low whisper, you're screwed now, before yanking the door open and opening fire. A barrage of BBS are flying at me at once and I didn't know that they were BBS in the moment so 
I literally thought that I was being shot with actual bullets. The popping sound resembled an actual gun too, and he had emptied an entire magazine into me, and I was in so much pain that I just couldn't even move. But once the pain subsided, I just left though without saying another word to him. At school, he would stare at me and follow me to all my classes. He would try to call me and text me, but I would always ignore him. Eventually, he left me alone, and a few years went by before I heard about him again through a mutual friend supposedly he had gone on the run after shooting his girlfriend in the head because she wouldn't let him have the last cigarette. He hasn't been seen or heard from since and to this day his whereabouts are actually unknown. His ex-girlfriend survived and thankfully made a full recovery as well but I just find it so unsettling to think about how I was best friends with such a psychotic person. So this experience is from November of 2018. I'd been working at this facility for two years at this time. For context, I'll try to describe what our floors look like in the jail. There's an elevator bay with a big metal door that is controlled by motor and chain. This is what we call main or main slider, and all traffic comes into the floor from this door. You go down a small passage and then you're in a space that is sort of the shape of a square with a smaller square room inside called the cube, which is surrounded by seven pods for inmates, and each pod has 12 cells and can fit two inmates. The cube is used for controlling doors and basically is an office space where paperwork can be filled out and where you can sit and watch the pods during your shift. I am assigned night shift on a floor of non-violent inmates, gen pop, Typical inmate that you'd find on this floor would be, I suppose, drug users, dealers, petty theft, and the occasional drunkard kind of deal. And I was working this floor by myself, and the night was starting off as usual as I show up. I lock down all the pods for the night, conduct my head count, and go back to the queue. An hour later, I conduct my hourly block check. Everybody's asleep or just chilling, so I return to the cube. And not the second that I finish sitting down... I hear the sound of someone kicking a cell door. I get up, I start flashing my light through the pods and eventually narrow it down to B pod 6 cell. One inmate is frantic, screaming that his cellmate is coughing up blood and is shaking. I open the door, remove the inmate and see that his cellmate is foaming from his mouth and is performing what is known as agonal breathing. Essentially we are listening to him take his final breaths. Long story short, Medical gets called and he eventually is taken to the hospital, but he doesn't make it to the hospital and he's declared dead on route. And I come to find out the inmate had swallowed some drugs before he was booked and one of the packages ruptured while he was in the jail. It was unfortunate, yes, but it's not the first time it's happened and surely won't be the last and so I file my paperwork and continue about life as normal. As another thing for context too, we have cameras in the individual cell blocks and the cells and we went back and watched the footage of the incident to confirm there wasn't any kind of assault or general roughhousing that would have caused the package to rupture. The next night too, I'm assigned the same floor, similar process comes and goes, I show up, lock down the pods, conduct count, stuff like that. An hour goes by and I do my standard check and I go back to the cube and again as I go to sit I hear three loud bangs coming from what sounds like B-Pod again. I go in and I flash my light, but everyone is sleeping or chilling. I return to the cube. There are three more bangs this time. I refer to my touchscreen to see if the kicking is tripping the lock sensor in the door or something. Sure enough, B-Pod 6 cell is showing that it's being messed with. But the cell was still locked down due to the events of the night before, so, that meant no inmate should have been in that cell. I go to the cell, open it, and double check to make sure nothing and no one is in that cell. And sure enough, nobody's in it. My next thought is that the lock is malfunctioning or something, so I exit the cell and walk to the cube to call for maintenance. And as I'm on the phone, the door slams shut 
which sends me back out to look, and at this point, I'm just at a loss for words and have no clue what to do. All the inmates of the pod are also trying to figure out what's going on in their pod. I'm trying to answer their questions, but genuinely, I have no clue what to tell them. It eventually goes quiet, maintenance arrives, I have them check the lock, and there's nothing in terms of it being a mechanical malfunction. After that night, I asked my watch supervisor to be placed on a different floor, which, at the time, we had just got a new batch of rookies in, so he gave me a choice of the floors. I've been on my new floor for a little over two years now, and I still have things happen that I can't explain such as audible footsteps from around the cube, the occasional tapping on the glass of the door to the cube itself. But nothing as drastic as that night in 2018, which I will never forget. About 20 years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I worked as a window coverings installer in Sacramento, California. One day, I was sent with a large load of metal mini blinds to an active veterans hospital off Highway 50. I met the lead maintenance man who thankfully loaned me a rolling cart to help make transporting my materials and tools a much easier chore. He then led me into the building through a maze of corridors and up a large service elevator. As we exited the elevator, I was pleasantly greeted with a completely empty hospital wing. I was really happy to see that I had the entire floor to myself. No patients, staff, or furniture to constrain my mission. I could work quickly without obstruction or distraction. The maintenance man explained how they just completed some seismic retrofits while pointing to some newly constructed drywall columns that concealed the brunt of their work. He said that they took that opportunity to make cosmetic repairs, install new blinds, and give the place a much-needed paint job. He then showed me a typical patient room and said that there should be one blind for every window on the floor. He told me that he would leave me to it and to give him a call if I needed anything, or when I was ready to leave. But the last thing that he said in a sort of concerned fatherly voice before entering the elevator was, Are you sure you're going to be alright up here? And I responded, Yeah man, absolutely, in my best and confident young man's voice. With a departing handshake, he entered the elevator cab. But for some reason, his question and his tone oddly hung with me as the doors closed and the whirl of the old elevator faded into a deafening silence. It was at that moment that I was truly able to take in my surroundings. With the elevator to my back, I scanned the hospital wing in a clockwise direction and I was standing in the middle of a long and rectangular room. Light and airy patient rooms filled the perimeter of the open room to my left. As I scanned right... The light quickly faded to an inky, opaque blackness that disappeared into a dark U-shaped corridor, which, after a short distance, made a sharp right and another sharp right to end up back where I started. Despite the new paint, too, the place looked like it exited a time machine circa 1950 or something, with those pea-green ceramic walls and matching asbestos vinyl floor tiles. It was at that moment that I realized that this place was really creepy. But enough of that. I had a job to do and I got right to work. But first things first, I walked the entire perimeter to get a quick survey of where things were located, popping my head into each room as I passed. As I got to the dark hallway, my sudden bravery waned a bit. Due to the lack of light, I presume there must not have been any windows to address, but I pushed on nevertheless to be thorough. As the dark engulfed me, it felt like all of a sudden someone plugged me into an electrical socket. I had never before or since felt the energy that surged my body and immediately picked up my pace. Along both sides of the corridor were black rooms, and after peeking in one, I abandoned my efforts for the absolute certainty that I was about to come face to face with something that I didn't want to see. I began to full-on run the rest of the distance until I was back in the main hall. Luckily, there was only one room within the dark corridor that had a blind that I needed to install. The entire time that I was back there, it felt like I had a thousand spectators and kept my eyes fixated on the doorway until I was done. The rest of my time in that wing, I was nervously on edge. 
The farther from the dark corridor I got to, the slightly more at ease I became. However, I kept hearing distinct footsteps, bangs, knocks, a bucket being kicked and slid across the floor, muffled voices and even a phantom intercom that sounded like an old movie. With 100% certainty, all these noises originated around me on that wing, despite there being no one present. And with each noise, I would pop my head out of the main hall or say, Hello? In what I'm sure was an uneasy voice. Now, about halfway through the install, I finally stopped reacting until I heard, Hello? And froze. It was the maintenance man and... Man, was I super stoked to see him. He asked how things were going and if anything eventful had happened. And not wanting to sound kooky, I just sort of sheepishly brought up some of the noises I was hearing. And he abruptly said, no way, this place is haunted. I wouldn't work up here alone. He explained to me that the hospital had been an active war hospital dating back to the 1940s. And there had been thousands of deaths in the operating rooms that lined that dark corridor. He also mentioned that an electrician walked out earlier that week after something ran up behind him and apparently growled at him. We joked around a bit to ease the tension and then he left me alone once again. And the rest of the day was surprisingly uneventful to be honest. The things seemed to have calmed down and I felt more calm. I do remember though never feeling more relieved to leave a place behind but also being completely exhausted that afternoon and crashing out to sleep early that evening. And to this day, this remains the strangest experience of my life to date. When I was young, I used to be one of the world's biggest chickens, really. I come from Arizona and... A spooky lore is something that comes with the territory. When I was around 11, we had moved to Kern County. The house we lived in was used by a mortuary for wakes and to keep bodies prior to burying. And when we first moved in the place, it really creeped me out. It made a lot of noise, which was unusual for a home that wasn't really that old. Anyway... I was a big reader of Fate magazine when I was young, and that was fuel for the fire for my overactive imagination. But I never really saw anything in that house, I think. I only really heard noises. Like people walking across the wooden floors. And there were nights when I couldn't sleep because of it as well. And to make matters worse, my mum would always hold seances with all of my older sister's friends, and everyone would get really scared because of them. Now one night, there was a carnival in town. I had gone there with my friend Pete. My sister went with her friend and my mum had taken my younger sister, who was still in a stroller. Pete and I left to go home at some point though and Pete walked me to my house. We said our goodbyes and then he left. I would never go directly into the house though because I knew where the light switch was and I would reach in with my arm and turn on the living room and the dining room lights before entering the house every time. Once I did this, those two rooms checked out okay, so I went into the kitchen and then down the hallway to my mum's room. Mum wasn't in her room, so I went to my sister Kathy's room. When I went there too, I could see from the hall light that she was in bed and under the covers. But weirdly, she was breathing really heavily, like in a really deep sleep or something. I didn't want to turn on her lights and wake her up though, so... I tiptoed in and checked the locks on her windows. They were locked and so I made my way to my room and, as usual, I took off my clothes and jumped into bed. I didn't turn on my room lights since I had the hall lights and the front room lights on. And I felt safe because Kathy was home and I started falling asleep. Now, as I was almost asleep, I heard my mum come in with my younger sister. She went directly into the kitchen and... I could hear her getting my sister's bottles ready. She walked into my room and asked if Kathy was home and I said yes, so she went back into the kitchen. I have to point out too that if you even so much as fart in this house, the floors creak so no one could get up and walk around without it being hurt. So I was just dozing off when my mum came in and man was she angry. 
she asked me, where's Kathy? I told her that she was in bed and my mum got more mad. She said to me, Kathy isn't in bed. Are you lying for Kathy so she can stay out late? I said, Mum, Kathy is in bed. When I came home, I went into her room and she was asleep under the covers and had the covers pulled over her head. I could hear her breathing really heavily. Mum got more mad and said, Show me. I walked into my sister's room. My mum had the light on already in there. I looked at the bed and when I did, it was untouched. Like no one had even sat on it. I ran over to the windows to check the locks and they were locked and because they were locked from the inside, there's no way that she could have gotten out and relocked the windows like that. My mum said, well, where is she? I just pointed at the bed horrified and said, you guys, you're playing a joke on me, aren't you? To which my mum responded, I'll show you a joke. And that went directly to my butt cheeks. During this period, Kathy got home and was read the riot act. But I stopped my mum and I told her and Kathy, look, there was something sleeping in Kathy's bed. That's why I thought it was her and that's why I told you that it was her. I could see the bed moving up and down from the breathing even. There was something in her bed and it wasn't her since she only just walked in and... I don't know. I don't want to sleep here tonight, okay? Ghost or not, I had to stay in my room that night. Kathy opted for the couch and my mum still wasn't buying my story. But whatever was in that room in that bed, I can tell you that I know for sure it was breathing. It had the appearance of a human body shape, and it's taken about five years off of my life, I think. This story takes place in a, a very small town in the Mexican woodland area, where everyone's houses had their own land for farming, animals, etc. It was back before the 1950s and a relative had suddenly and mysteriously passed away and this shocked the family since it was unexpected because the person showed zero sign of ever even being sick. So, the next day they had the funeral and buried him in the backyard. But something about the houses too in my family's town is that since they still had the old-fashioned outhouses, these outhouses would not be connected to the house. You would have to walk at least like 20 to 40 meters away from the house to use them. Now, late in the evening, the same day as the funeral, my mum's great aunt, who was a little girl at the time, needed to use the restroom. So she walked herself to use it, and as she was walking near where they buried her uncle, she heard pounding and screaming coming from an unknown area. If you don't know about Mexican folklore, there's this legend of La Llorona, the crying lady, which everyone is desperately afraid of. My mum's great aunt, upon hearing this, ran back inside the house and woke up her mum and dad. They brushed her off and told her to just go back to sleep. As she was trying to fall back to sleep though, her mind kept on playing tricks on her as she kept on hearing the screams and the pounding. Later the same night she needed to use the restroom again but she was still too traumatized to go alone so she woke up her older sibling to help walk with her. They have no issue with this and they both make their way to the restroom. And as she's using the restroom, they both begin to hear the cries once again, and they both bolt back into the house and wake up their parents. Angered at first, but since it was the older sibling who was hearing the cries as well, the mum and dad left as if they knew what was going on. The dad goes to his brother's house down the lane and he wakes up his brother. The both of them go to grab shovels and begin to dig where they buried their recently deceased family member. It took quite a while until they were able to dig where the coffin was, but... As they opened it, they saw that he was laying on his stomach now. The dad and his brother quickly turned the body over to his back and they all screamed at what they saw. There, they saw their relative covered in bloody claw marks all over his face, neck and arms. All along the coffin walls, they saw pounding marks and claw marks. It haunted my family knowing that they had buried him alive. He was now for sure dead due to most likely either a heart attack or from the lack of oxygen. But my family doesn't know why he appeared to be dead when they first buried him. 
most likely due to the one sickness where someone appears to be dead, but in reality they're just in a, a coma-like state. Back when I was 18, my friends and I decided to go on a trip to some rural area to relax on our own for a couple of days. Luckily, my late grandparents owned a medium-sized house in a remote village, but there are plenty of those where I'm from. So I got the keys from my dad and we packed food, water and a first aid kit and we headed out. It was a two hour ride from the closest city to get there. The car dropped us off in the middle of nowhere and told us to walk in a straight line until we get to the village. After about 30 minutes of walking, we reached our destination and it was nothing fancy let me tell you but the village was definitely bigger than expected. Dogs, chickens and goats roamed around freely. I was a city boy so that sight was a first for me. But we got to my grandparents house, settled in. We spent the first day of it just resting and decided to go to a spot that my father told me about tomorrow morning. We headed out at daybreak and we packed plenty of water. The spot was close by so we didn't think to pack any food. After about a 30 minute walk I would say, in the middle of a heavily wooded mountain mind you, we finally got to our destination. It was a beautiful area too, with a huge tree and an amazing view, but it wasn't enough for the five young idiots who came there to explore, right? So we kept moving forward, just looking around and having fun. But without realizing it, we'd spent like an extra one and a half hours up there. We were exhausted and, more importantly, we were hungry, so we decided to head back. We followed the trail, but we never really reached that big tree again even after like an hour of fast walking. We began to panic a bit and went from fast walking to jogging, but for some reason, even though we should have been backtracking, we didn't make it to the tree again. And it was there that we spotted an old woman walking the trail. We quickly approached her, said hello and asked how close was the village. She looked at us weirdly and told us that we were walking the opposite way this whole time and that the village was like a three hour walk away. We were super exhausted by that point. Three of us could barely stand, let alone walk for three hours. We explained to the old woman about our situation after she asked us and she offered us to rest at her place and apparently it was close by. Get a meal so we can get home safely. One of my friends, Adam, and I protested that it might be a bad idea to follow a stranger, even though we were in a rough situation. But between the hunger and the state of the others, we gave in and agreed. We followed her towards her cabin, small with a tiny garden in front of it, and a goat tied to a post next to the door. Overall, it was nothing out of the ordinary, to be honest. Not in these parts of the country, anyway. We got in, sat down on these long sofas with no back support. She told us to wait while she got us some food. The cabin was surprisingly very clean. The tables, the chairs, the sofas were obviously old and worn out, but not dusty and overall the place looked really welcoming, to be honest. However, Adam and I didn't fully drop our guard while the others were simply happy that they got a soft thing to sit on. Fifteen minutes later, she came out from the kitchen with two big plates of chicken and vegetables. There was a plate of salad and some olive oil, and she poured us some tea, and we dug in as she went back to the kitchen to prepare more. I was considering not eating at first, at least until I saw the others ate, and they're still good, but my hunger took over, and I went right into it as soon as the plates hit the table. Adam, however, didn't. He didn't lay a finger on the food, nor the tea. He was really paranoid. He was always the most fit out of all of us, so he managed to hold back. She brought us two more plates of food that we cleaned up pretty quickly. She brought more tea and told us to rest and digest the food, and leave whenever we felt like it. She then excused herself, and she went to her room to sleep as she was tired of cooking. We got to relaxing and drifted off one by one to sleep as I set an alarm clock to ring after 30 minutes so we could move then and I was the last one to drift off talking to Adam who said that he was going to stay awake and look around for a bit before we move and after that all I remember is going to sleep. I was shook awake though by my friends who 
suddenly looked worried. I snapped awake after I saw their faces and I looked around and asked them what was going on. One of them points out the window and tells me to look. I didn't get it at first but then I noticed. It was sunrise. I almost had a heart attack. I thought that we'd overslept for a whole day but man it was so much worse. Adam was nowhere to be found. We went out of the cabin and called but there was no answer so I went back in to ask the old woman. I knocked on the door to the room that she went in before I fell asleep but I got no response. The door wasn't locked though so I decided to excuse myself and go in and when I did it was the first time since I went on this trip that I was now in full panic mode because in that room there was no bed. In fact there was nothing like nothing at all just four walls and a door the kitchen was the same as well i ran to my phone to try and call adam the signal there was weak but it still worked but my phone was off dead battery but it was around 70 percent when i fell asleep so that didn't make any sense all our phones were dead so we got out and we started running on the trail towards the village while calling adam's name after a while, we met some people from the village, my grandparents' neighbors, and they looked almost scared when they saw us. And then, they dropped this bomb on all of us. Where have you guys been for the past three days? I was shocked, to say the least. Apparently, I'd been missing for three days. My parents got concerned because I didn't answer the phone and called those neighbors to ask about me. They even reported me missing to the authorities. The whole village was looking for us for two days apparently and we asked for help to find Adam but after we told them about what happened they took us to the local mosque so the imam could look into it. They thought that it was witchcraft. We went back there the next day with the same men from the village looking for Adam. We showed them the cabin and its surroundings and we looked for hours on end but there was just no sign of him anywhere. We eventually gave up when the police took over, but even they couldn't find much. To this day, I still wonder what happened. I'm religious, but I just can't accept that the woman was a witch. Even if she was, I mean, why only Adam? Why not all of us? Is it because he didn't eat or because he went snooping around a cabin or something? A part of me wants to get back there so that I could uncover the truth, but every time I even think about this incident, I, I just get this crippling feeling. Obviously, we were questioned by authorities extensively, and a lot of people suspected that we were the ones to blame, but where is Adam, and what happened to him? Last December, I fled an abusive relationship and I crashed with my friend Amy. She lives in an upper level duplex that is quite small and I stayed there for a while with my cat and dog, which was a lot as she has a dog also. The next door to the duplex is a cute old four bedroom house that is owned by Mark, a friend of Amy's who lives abroad. The couple who was renting out Mark's place bought a house and moved out recently so they suggested to me that it would be a great place to stay for a little while at least until I found my apartment. I was absolutely elated too and agreed immediately. Mine and Amy's dog could play every day and we could still see each other all the time. I was excited at the opportunity and paid Mark some rent but mostly he just wanted to help me out with my situation and someone to house it until he came home in May. I live in a very cold, snowy climate, so looking for a place in May is exponentially easier too. Now, Amy informed me that the house had quirks and a creepy basement, and told me if I ever felt creeped out in there, all alone like I would be, that I could come back over. She had lived in that house for a couple of years too, so I took her word for it. When one of the tenants showed me the place for the first time, I definitely felt something very off too. I chalked it up to the weird layout, the draft and the lack of sunlight in the rear of the house too. Upstairs was two bedrooms though and a bathroom in the middle. The front bedroom was warm and sunny and the rest of the upstairs was just very cold though. 
noticeably colder than the rest of the house, in fact. Upon entering the back upstairs bedroom, it felt like a downward shift, though. Like, the energy in that room felt so strange, and I felt like I just wasn't wanted in there. I know, it sounds weird, but I barely looked around and just closed the door behind me. But the first couple of weeks, too, nothing much happened but I just never felt at ease. I felt like I was being watched. I wrote it off as being easily spooked in a large house, and it was my first time living alone, too. But soon, I started having trouble sleeping despite my room, the upstairs front bedroom, being the only place in the house that I ever felt at ease. One night, though, I decided to smoke and watch a movie in the living room kind of late at night. I fell asleep on the couch and woke up to... What I swore was someone running up the stairs and then slamming the back bedroom door. My dog looked startled too and ran upstairs and started growling at the closed door. I quickly went up there to check it out, but no one was in there. Some nights after that too, I heard footsteps pacing in the back room. The next thing that started happening though was while I was in the bathtub in the upstairs bathroom. My dog would lay in the doorway and just stare at that back room. Sometimes he would growl or bark at it. I would also come home to find the door open when I had definitely shut it. Or I would hear my cat meowing to be let in the room. On a couple of occasions I found my cat shut in that room too. And Also around this time my bath towel went missing and I looked absolutely everywhere for it but couldn't find it. All of this it began to take a, a real toll on me too. I started having nightmares every night and I would wake up almost every night to my dog whining between 3 and 4 in the morning. I always felt like I was being watched in the house and the whole thing just felt so heavy. I told Amy about all this and she confessed to me that she had some weird experiences in that house too when she lived there as well. Her bedroom was the back room and a couple of times she woke up in a sort of semi-dream state to a man at the end of her bed and began talking to it. She then woke up for real and saw texts from her roommate asking who she was talking to. She also would see things moving out of the corner of her eye, hear footsteps and feel like she was being watched. She told me of an instance of seeing footsteps in the snow going from the back door to the middle of the lawn and just disappearing. But one day... I was in the living room, hearing footsteps, and just felt so overwhelmed by the presence. I was crying and decided to have a go talking to it. I said, hey, listen, I know that this is your house too. I'm leaving in a month, okay? I've been through so much pain these past few months. Please, just, just leave me alone. Just let me know that you've heard me too, okay? And then the door upstairs slammed shut instantly. And that was the last that I'd heard of it for a while. What I mean is that my nightmare stopped. I started sleeping through the night and felt less of the presence, if that makes sense. One night, though, I was hanging out with Amy in her backyard with our dogs and her downstairs neighbor, Sam, to celebrate me finding an apartment finally. I went back into my house for some more beers and to grab a sweater. I went to run up the stairs and... Standing there, at the top of the stairs, was what I can only describe as an opaque black silhouette. I couldn't make out any features, but it was as real as a person standing there. I screamed, and I ran back down and turned on the stairway light, only to find nobody there, and the back room open. Finally, though, my move-out date arrived, and I felt so relieved to feel absolutely nothing in my new apartment. I did go back to the house one last time to check to see if I forgot anything, and there, right in the middle of the floor of the back room, was my bath towel, still slightly damp as if I just used it. I have no idea how it got there, I have no idea where it went all this time. One thing is for sure. I have not been back to that place since then.
In 2001, I was about 17. My family moved to the coast because my father had just gotten a job in the area. Because it was a bit of an urgent move too, and the amount of rental properties that were available immediately were very few, we had to move into a three-bedroom house that needed some work. It was meant to be a temporary home until we found something more suitable, I guess, but we just needed to go to school and work in the meantime, and so we took it. The previous tenants weren't the tidiest of people, so we spent days cleaning while already living in the house. I remember my mother commenting that the house just didn't want to be cleaned too. We painted the walls, but stains would always appear, regardless of how many coats we applied to. We eventually had to carry on with our lives though, and it was only meant to be a temporary situation after all, so we didn't get too fussed about it. Being a teenager though and a middle child, I spent quite some time by myself in my room. Mostly I would listen to music at night while lying on my bed, relaxing before I would get tired enough to fall asleep. At one point though, something strange started happening. I would be lying on my bed with my eyes closed and I swear that I could feel the bed sink next to my feet as if someone was sitting down. I assumed it was my old cat jumping up on my bed but when I looked to see where he was so I could pet him, he wasn't there. I shrugged it off as nothing at the time, just my overthinking it. I thought that maybe I was just drifting off into sleep or something, but it happened again and again, and I soon realized that it was never my cat. In fact, I also noticed that my cat did never come into my room. None of our cats did. I started getting slightly concerned after a while. I mentioned it to my mum, thinking to myself that it sounded like nothing, a mere trick of the mind. I still felt uneasy though, if I'm being honest. It was like there was something wrong, something I couldn't prove or even see. A nagging sense that I just wasn't alone in my room. I stopped sleeping with my curtains drawn. They were always open now. I needed the natural light coming from outside to feel safe enough to sleep, I suppose. And my concerns were confirmed one night that I still remember clearly to this day, almost 20 years later. So, I woke up, just suddenly terrified. I had an intense fear, unlike anything that I'd ever experienced before or ever since. And I couldn't move. There was also a tree outside of my room casting shadows in my cupboard, which was right in front of my bed. And somehow, I just knew that there was something bad right there in front of me, among those shadows. I could feel it, like an overwhelming presence filling the space in front of me. An evil, threatening presence. I saw too that one of the shadows in my cupboard was moving. And this shadow was much darker and moved with intention is the only way that I can put it. As soon as I spotted it, I knew that that was the source of my fear. I did the only thing that I could to protect myself too. I prayed. After what felt like forever trapped, I was finally able to move. Still terrified, too terrified to go past my cupboard to the door right next to it, I hid under my blanket. 17 years old and hiding under a blanket like the boogeyman was under my bed. Eventually, I fell asleep in the early hours of the morning as daylight started coming through the windows. I know what sleep paralysis is and I'm convinced that this wasn't it. But the fear that I felt that night as I hid in my bed, feeling like I'm not alone in my room, is something that I'll never forget. A month or two after the incident, my parents found a better place, thankfully. I was scared of my room until we moved, too. I always slept with my head under the covers and made sure enough light was coming into the room, and after we moved, it was like my family finally felt safe enough to speak about the darkness that we all knew was in that house. My brother told us about a dark figure that he saw moving through the corridor area in the kitchen. My father said that he saw a dark shape in the corridor near my room, but it was what my mother told me after we'd moved that shook me the most. 
She told me that when a family friend and his wife visited us and stayed in my room, he told my mother the following day that there was something evil in there. He was known for sensing the supernatural and seemed quite spooked to my mother as he was telling her this and I could see when she was telling me about this that she was spooked as well. When I asked her what he said exactly as I was recollecting my memories to tell this story, she said that he had just said that he didn't want to elaborate on it, because if he did, that he would never go into that room again. And well, that's not much better, I thought. The family friend has since then passed away without ever really elaborating on what exactly he sensed in that house. But my mother also told me that she heard that the couple that moved in after us had a priest come to cleanse the house too. I still am suspicious of every house that I move into after this, now with my own family, I'm making sure to burn sage every so often. I just don't ever want to share a house with something evil like that ever again. Six years ago, I was a new mum, learning to balance my job, family, and health. My social life primarily existed on the internet at this time, and Facebook and Instagram were the main ways that I kept in contact with others. I received a friend request from Stephen, an old friend from high school, and I accepted, and everything was normal for a while. After a couple of months, Stephen sent a DM asking how I was. The conversation was fine, I guess, but it didn't take too long for me to realize that this wasn't the Stephen that I knew. They had the same first and common last name. His profile picture was not a picture of himself, so I never realized that this was a different person. Either way, we had several mutual friends, and he didn't do anything especially creepy, so I left him on my friends list. He would occasionally message and chat, and he just seemed like someone that was a bit socially awkward, but harmless. I would always respond, but kept the conversations brief. Now one day, I got a text from him, which really surprised me because I never gave him my number. I asked how he got my number, and he said from my website, which was fair, I'll admit. I'm an artist and had email and phone contact info on my art site. He began texting several times a day, and I would give him short responses, followed with something like, at work, talk to you later, or dinner with the fam, have a good evening. He started talking about his new boyfriend, saying that he was one of the few gay conservatives and things were going well. I told him that I'm glad that he has a partner that aligns with him and wish them well. He sort of then began talking a, a lot about conservative politics and was really aggressive about it. I told him that I was a liberal, so it was probably best that we didn't have these conversations. And it was at this point that his messages began turning sexual, where he would ask if I wanted to hear about the sex parties him and his boyfriend threw. I told him no, I didn't really know him and it was inappropriate. One day I was busy with work and returned to my phone to see dozens of messages from him angry that I wasn't responding and he went on and on sharing very graphic sexual stories. I responded and told him that I'd been polite to him because he seemed like he didn't have many friends but this was too much and I was blocking him. I told him that I didn't believe that he was gay in fact and he was just saying it in an attempt to make me think that he was harmless. I proceeded to block him on social media and I blocked his phone number too. A couple of days later though I started getting lots of friend requests from accounts that I didn't have mutual friends with. I knew that they were probably fake pages that he was creating. I would block them and move on. Then I began getting phone calls and texts from fake phone numbers. Same thing, I would block them and move on. I messaged our mutuals to ask what they knew about him and surprisingly, none of them actually knew him. He had just requested them and they accepted apparently. And he began sending requests to my friends, family and other women that I knew. I let everyone know that they needed to block him and for months not a day passed that I didn't get a weird call or friend request or DM or something. 
It would range from a normal, hey, how are you, to vague threats of, I could make you talk to me if I really wanted to. He lived several hours away though, so I wasn't particularly concerned. And things got quieter. Until one evening, my notifications started going off like crazy, and my phone was ringing with unknown numbers. It was on my art page too, that probably 15 different accounts had posted well, explicit images on my page, or things like OP is a whore, or OP is a thief, and things like this. I knew it was him too, because he also accidentally posted from his real account. I didn't realize that I never blocked him from that page. He also sent a message to my art page saying sorry for that, and he missed his friend and he was just trying to get my attention. I didn't respond. I just blocked him and I even called the police at this point. But since stalking and harassment laws are pretty much awful, they didn't do anything. Later that night though, I must have woken up at around 2 o'clock in the morning for no reason other than I was just having trouble sleeping. I was up for a while playing on my phone when I started hearing a strange sound coming from the living room. It was back and forth between quiet cracking and scratching and at the time we lived in a large ranch house and the living room was at the other end of a long hall. I got up thinking that my cats were into something or maybe after a mouse or something. I flipped on the living room light and the sound immediately stopped. I scanned around looking for my cats when I noticed an open window. Our windows were large from floor to ceiling and opened by pulling them down from the top and the top of the window still had pry marks and the lock, it was now broken. Thankfully, this house was old and the windows did not open easily and he had only been able to open it about 8 inches but I immediately woke up my husband, got my son out of his room and called the cops. I knew that it was Stephen too. It was too big of a coincidence that he blew up that day and then someone tries to break into my house in the middle of the night like that. But we couldn't prove it was him, obviously. There was no evidence other than what happened that day that pointed to him. But the police did speak to him and I believe it scared him enough to leave me alone. I was obviously horrified at the time and I began looking up anything that I could to find out more about him. And... I wound up finding his YouTube channel, which solidified my fears even more. He posted Rush Limbaugh style rants when he would get angrier and angrier until he was red faced and nearly spitting. He frequently talked about violence and would show off his gun collection. This led me to finding out his real name too. I googled his name and found that he had apparently been arrested two years prior for holding a woman against her will in a hotel and attempted to assault her. Thankfully, she was able to escape with just a bloody lip. We moved not long later and I removed my phone number from my site and locked down all of my social media. I still sleep with a baby monitor in my son's room because I'm scared of someone coming in at night. His YouTube channel, it was shut down after a bit too and I haven't heard from him since. Myself and my mother were driving. Where? I, I can't really recall because it was a long time ago. But I do remember her pulling up to a stop sign. We seemed to be sitting at this stop sign for what seemed like the longest stop ever too. For a stop sign that is. I remember her looking both ways. She looked right and then she looked left. And then I remember her gazing at me from her rearview mirror. She had such a gentle smile upon her face as a loving mother would looking at her child with such love. But just then, her face went from joyous to complete worry and panic. I see her eyes pan from me to the seat next to me. I hear the back passenger door open. As I'm turning my attention from my mother to the noise of the car door opening, I see this man entering the car. He sits next to me and continues to tell my mother to drive. There was a, a different kind of vibe from this man though. He didn't seem to be pleased by either one of us in the car. Even the fact that he just hopped in the car with people that he didn't even know was weird. 
He seemed so very calm though. Said very little, but enough to get his point across. He had long salt and pepper hair, and at the time I thought that he had dreadlocks, but as an adult, I believe that his hair was most likely ratty from not brushing or washing it. His clothes were worn, torn, dirty, and dulled from the sun. I remember seeing his toes peeking out of these what were once black work boots. His jeans were tied together from where they had been torn and ripped. His skin seemed so badly sun-kissed and filthy from the lack of bathing. An odor was coming from this guy too that truly had my nose hairs curling. The smell filled the car and I could tell my mother could smell it too because she kept wiping the back of her hand across her nose. My mother told the man that she wanted him to get out of the car. Her voice, she was trying to be stern and demanding but she was such a kind-hearted woman that her yelling sounded like she was singing. So, of course, the man disregarded her chirps. He sat in the back seat and said, drive please, just up the way. I so badly wanted to glare and stare at this guy, but I didn't want to upset him too. I'm leaning as far as I can against my door with my head down and hands in my lap. I feel the car jerk forward. I can hear my mother breathing heavily, as she's obviously worried about this guy in the back seat with me. I can't say that I was really scared of him or anything. I guess I was just more curious as to how he could just so boldly get into a car with strangers and be so cool about it. I was always taught never to take rides from people that I didn't know. So, where was he going, I had thought. Where does he live? I can only imagine the things that were going through her mind as she's driving a complete stranger up the street with her kid in the back with him, not even three feet away from me. The car continues to drive down the road a ways more. Then he leans forward from the seat, gazing out the window watching the scenery go by, his hand on the handle of the door. He says, here, and my mother quickly jerks the car to the dirt, the car skidding to gain traction to bring the car to a complete stop. His passenger door flung open and he bolts up and out from the car and he didn't even get a chance to close the door himself. My mother had sped off so fast too that the car slammed the door shut and then I hear the car doors lock. When I was younger, 17, I lived in a small village of like 1,200 people. Usually every year there's this local town festival and all the adults go out for dinner and party at the town hall, where they perform some acting and make fun of the year that just passed. Usually this is in February, so it's snowy and dark pretty early. And when this festival is on, there are absolutely all 13 to 17 year old girls booked for babysitting. But me and my two friends, we went for a drive around the town since you have to be 18 to go to the party. So we just sort of drove around giving people lifts to the party and earn some extra cash. Since there's no taxi in town, this was a great way to get some extra pocket money, I guess. But we'd been driving for maybe a couple of hours now and of course we knew where everyone lived and some of the adults asked us to drive past their house to make sure everything is alright and give the parents some extra comfort. I think it was also to give us some tasking until the party was over so they could get a lift home. But in one of the older neighborhoods in the town, there were these low floodlights. We would just drive slowly, and one mum who we gave a lift earlier lived there. She was a widow with three young children, two, four, and eight, if I recall correctly, and her niece was babysitting, and she was 15. The time must have been around 10 p.m., I would guess, and when we drove in this neighborhood, which is surrounded by hills and some cliffs, my friend swore that he saw something move in her garden. We didn't think much of it, and just sort of said that it was probably a cat or something. We kept driving to the other end of town, but my friend in the back seat said that he just had a bad feeling and wanted to drive back to a house to check if we could see some footprints in the snow or anything like that. We turned around, and when we got back there, we parked the car and looked over the fence, and yeah, there were fairly new human footprints in the snow, adult size. So we we we'll just sort of looked at each other and decided to follow the trail. The trail went past all the bedrooms, but near every window, the footprint turned to the window like someone was trying to peek in, and eventually the trail ended on the street, and 
We lost it there where the snowplow had been earlier in the night. We chatted whether or not if we should go and get the mum from the party or ring the doorbell to check if everything was alright. Since none of the tracks led to the back door or the front door, we decided that two of us would stay in the neighbourhood, sort of hidden and monitor the house, and the driver would drive to the police station and pick up the mum on the way back. And that was a very good call. Maybe five minutes after he left, we saw someone lurking behind one of the garage couple houses down the road, and he wasn't moving, just sort of sat there with a cigarette. We monitor from a distance since he couldn't see us. Then he stood up, looked around, and started to creep to the house where the mum lived, and then he walked to the back door. Without thinking, me and my friend ran through the two gardens that were between where we were and the mum's house was, so we could watch him trying to enter the back door. We arrived just in time. He was trying to open the door when we shouted at him, What are you doing? And he made a run for it, and we followed. He ran down the street to get some speed ahead of us, I think, but we were both pretty athletic, so we were gaining on him. I must admit, too, that this was the most intense moment of my life ever, and I remember the only thing that I was thinking was not to slip and lose momentum. The end of the street was approaching, though, and the next turn would be 90 degrees to the right, so instead of slowing down, I jumped off the street so that I could intercept him after he would lose speed by taking the turn. Well, my calculation was dead wrong though and he managed to take the turn without losing much speed. I spent too much energy sprinting in the snow and I knew that I would have to slow down at this point. I was still about 10 meters behind him but my friend was closer and gaining on him and when my friend realized that he could kick his feet and trip him, he did. He fell and this was the quickest takedown ever. Smashed his head to the frozen ground and he was just completely out just like that. While we were catching our breath, he didn't move. We rolled him over on his back and he was breathing, but really shallow with a sort of crackling noise. I was terrified. Millions of questions came to my head, like, is he dying? What if this was just some relative making a prank? Why did we even chase him? Meanwhile, my friend checked his pockets and there was a lubricant, strong sedatives and a broken camera in there. Luckily for us too, the driver came a couple of minutes after the mum and the police. Then the ambulance arrived and they took him away. The day after, we were brought forth for questioning in the police station and the chief told us that he was a known pedophile, not from our town apparently, and we for sure saved the day and probably more kids since the tumble that he took when he fell. He got bleeding in the brain and is not even able to wipe his own butt anymore. We told him the story and when my friend said that he tripped him, the chief stopped typing and said, Are you sure that you tripped him? The way I see it, you three heroes caught a burglar in the act and while he was running away, he fell and hit his head, right? And looked at us and nodded with a soft smile. But thinking back, this perv must have planned this. Knowing when the festival was, knowing that she was a single mum, picking at the house, knowing where and when and exactly what to do, and knowing that really gives me the creeps. So this situation happened maybe about a year ago now. It's important to note that I'm also a girl, so this was a very scary and potentially dangerous situation for both of us. So one night after work, just after it had become dark, my girlfriend stopped at the Walmart neighborhood market down the road, which by the way is next to a big highway or interstate. I made a last minute run to the bank, and right as I'm pulling out of the bank, I get a text from her about thinking that she's being followed. I asked her for more details and also told her not to leave the store and that I was going to drive up to the front door and either watch her get to her car or have her get in mine if she needed. She told me that there were two men that she kept seeing in every single aisle, usually behind her. They were very clearly staring at her each time and watching her very closely. She thought that she was just being paranoid, but I told her to trust her gut and that she should let a worker know about the situation and even call the police because it wasn't worth the risk. Before I had made it all the way there though, she texted me that she was in the checkout. 
She said that the guys followed her there and went to a self-checkout near her but with no items. They quickly grabbed some gum from the shelf and put it into a Walmart sack but they just sort of stood there taking forever to cash that item out and kept watching her and waiting for her to finish. I told her to check out as slowly as humanly possible and I finally arrived there. She had just texted me that they finally took their bag and exited the store. However, right as I pulled up, I saw two guys that perfectly matched her description of them hiding in a little cutout near the entrance. They were just standing there and kept peeking around the corner at the front door every single time someone exited, and I knew that they were looking for her. I pulled my car forward right in front of them and literally rolled my window down and just stared into their souls, I didn't look away and I wanted to make sure that even though they didn't know that I had anything to do with her that I got a very, very good look at their faces and was watching them. I texted her and told her not to return to her car. I told her to get straight into mine and right then they started walking off. However, they had to have been following her since she arrived because the next thing they did was walk straight to her car her car is very unique and stands out. They dropped the bag with the gum in it on the ground on the way to her car and one of them went between her car and the one next to it squatted down by the trunk and just stayed there. The next one walked over to a white work van with painted windows and no license plate. He spoke to someone that was in the driver's seat. While this was happening, one of the cars next to hers left and they then pulled the van up into that spot. Upon seeing this, I obviously called her and told her to go straight to my car and don't even look at hers as they were waiting for her with a van. She comes out with groceries and they see her and squat down and we quickly load them up and she gets in my car. The man stood up and walked to the van and I pull away and try to go around the van to catch a license plate number and of course that's when I noticed that there was none. I drove in a totally different direction from home and we drove around for a while. I wanted to make sure that nobody was following us of course and also to give them time to leave her car alone. I wanted to call the cops but she was convinced that we were just seeing things that weren't there. Like taking coincidences and making them into something. Obviously looking back after having talked in depth about both of our experiences and things witnessed... We definitely should have called the cops and I really regret not doing it. And I have since seen that van with the same two guys driving. Back in the neighborhoods behind the Walmart too. I was turning onto the street that they were turning off of. Still no license plate. But their van had more things on the exterior to make it look like a work van. Things like a ladder on the roof and stuff like that. I got so creeped out that I quickly tried to get away just in case they turned around and tried to come for me. And so I just floored at home. Again, I thought about calling the police, but I mean, what would I say at this point? Yeah, there's two men driving away from a neighborhood with a work van. Go and get them. They don't even take most things seriously, even when it results in something actually happening here. I just truly hope that there's a valid explanation for all of these actions and that I just came to a conclusion that was not the case and was just being dramatic. But, I don't know. Like, maybe they waited at the front because they didn't see their buddy with the van and thought that he might be inside the Walmart and were just watching for him. Her car is very cool, so maybe they just looked at it and, I don't know, maybe they just wanted to steal parts off of a car or something. Maybe there's an explanation, but probably not, right? It doesn't explain them following her or getting gum in a bag just to drop it in the parking lot. Anyway, luckily I haven't heard of any kidnappings coming out of Walmart, but who knows. I haven't been digging for it or anything, but I do know that I'm extra cautious now and try not to go out past dark. I also scan the parking lot for the van before I go in, but normally I just do the curbside pickup now. My girlfriend, she does the same thing. When I was 14 years old, I went to a church gathering on Halloween night that was called Hallelujah Night. 
It was a Christian alternative to Halloween. My family and I would get there in the afternoon since we'd volunteer to help set up the booths, the cakewalk, candy barrels, all that sort of stuff. But I was mostly there to just get first dibs on all of the candy, if I'm being honest. After I finished helping with the usual booth that I helped set up, I took a seat on a bench near the main sanctuary. It was my favorite place to sit at since I could see the entire lot and, most of all, the beautiful sunset. I pulled out my PSP at the time and was scrolling through some music that I had on it when some guy approached me and started a conversation. I've never been a people person though, so usually when things like this happen, I just keep the conversation short. However, this guy had this weird type of warmth to him as if he was a friend of mine. As the conversation carried on too, I started to ask him if he was new because I hadn't seen him before. He told me that he had been going to this church for years but left after an incident happened. When I asked him about the incident, he paused, looked at me and said that there's some things people pick up on that they know aren't normal. Also, that you should never get curious about things that you know you should leave alone. I had a sort of confused look on my face, as you can imagine, since I didn't know what he meant at that time. The guy noticed it and said that I would understand once I got older. I looked down at my PSP that I had in my hand still and looked back up and... When I did, the guy was just gone. I looked around and I couldn't find him anywhere in the lot except for a few people still prepping for hallelujah night and it just didn't make any sense fast forward to a few months later and i was sitting in the main sanctuary before leaving to do my usual volunteer work on the upper floor the upper floor was a daycare area for kids so at the end of the service volunteers would escort the children downstairs and i would go into each room shutting off the lights and making sure no children were still up there and I'll never forget getting up to leave to do my usual duties when the pastor started tacking about an upcoming funeral or something. I looked at the big screens on each side of the main sanctuary and the face of that man that I was talking to during Hallelujah Night was right there on the screen. I couldn't believe what I was seeing to be honest. To this day it still seems unreal as well. I was beyond shook as I made my way out of the main sanctuary and to the flights of the big stairs as I went to the upper floor. Once I made it to the upper floor, another volunteer had confirmed that all the children were escorted downstairs and she noticed that I had looked sort of pale from seeing what I saw in the main sanctuary and asked me if I was okay. I told her that it was nothing and proceeded to cut off all the lights on the upper floor as she left downstairs. The upper floor was like a giant hallway with doors on each side and a door at the end of the hallway with a giant window in it. When I came to the last room at the end of the hall, I would always leave the blinds on that big window open since the light always illuminated the dark hallway and made me feel less scared. But as I left the room, I just remember feeling panicked. It started to get freezing and I felt like if I left that room, something was waiting for me in the darkened rooms that were going to jump out and attack me. And as I'm trying to muster up the courage to just run for it, I see a small head of a child peek out of a couple of doors down. It stayed there for a few seconds too and then it put its head back in the room. I immediately called out to the child but there was no answer. And the fear that I had maybe a minute ago was now gone as I left the last room to go through the illuminated hallway. I made it to the other room in a matter of seconds, cutting on the lights and searching the entire room for the kid that I saw, but there was no one there. I started getting spooked again as I cut off the lights in that room, and then one of the most terrifying things that I have ever seen and experienced happened. As I was leaving the room, I looked back at the last room's window, which illuminated the hallway, and out of nowhere, there was this massive black mass moved in front of the window almost covering the light completely it was darker than black and its outline as it covered the light seemed to be moving almost it was enough to scare me to run for my life and i ran the rest of the hallway and down the stairs i was stopped by one of the ushers who told me not to run but when i told him what i saw he looked at me as if 
I was crazy. Once church was over, I told my parents about what happened on the ride home and they ended up not believing me since, well, they're skeptics. But I know what I saw that day and it's something that it still terrifies me to this very day. This happened back when I was 14, but even with my bad memory, I remember this years later. I honestly think that this memory is going to haunt me for the rest of my life, in fact. So, I would often go walking either alone or with my neighbor Jem, but this specific night she didn't go with me. I usually went walking around 9 at night, but was impatient that night, so I left about 15 minutes early. It was summer in Texas, but I grabbed my black hoodie anyway. The reason for this was because I was a pretty small kid, even for my age, and I would walk with a knife in my sleeve in case of a problem. There was security in this area, but they were pretty much useless and weren't fond of the kids anyway. So the black hoodie was to avoid them seeing me and to maybe help avoid being noticed by anyone else too. But the area was heavily wooded, and the roads had no street lights, mind you. I had lived there my whole life, though, so with the moonlight, this wasn't really an issue. I could see things as much as I needed to to get around. So I walked to the park in the area and sat down on the swing set like I had a million times before. The park was old and wasn't very well taken care of, so the swing set creaked and the wooden picnic tables were half rotted with the paint mostly peeled away, and the metal slide was covered in rust. There was the main road that ran in front of the park, and a branch off road that ran along the side of the park. There was sort of a thin line of trees between the side road and the park too. After a while, a favorite song of mine came on, and I, of course, started singing it since singing was a big way that I let out stress despite my stage fright. But I had a tendency to not hold back when swinging at this park since there was rarely people near it during the day, let alone at night. My blood ran cold when I saw the shape of a person maybe 50 to 100 feet in front of me on the main road. The main reason for the chill too was the fear that this random person actually heard me sing, but then I... I got a deeper and worse feeling. Something was just wrong about them. I noticed that the person was walking fast, like really fast, almost running speed in fact. I figured that he might have been running from something or after something, but when I looked around everywhere that I could possibly see from where I was, I saw nothing else but them. They soon passed by the park not seeming to notice me and after a few minutes of waiting to make sure that they were gone I continued singing. After a couple more songs I decided that it was time to go home. I still had that bad feeling of course, that uneasy pit in my stomach that you get when you're being watched. I even thought that I saw something behind the tree line between the side road and the swings but I brushed that off as an animal or something. A deer were really common here. So were dogs and things, so it was probably me just getting spooked by an animal again. But the feeling just was eating away at me. So I cut my usual 30 minutes to an hour walk to about 10 minutes. I got up and started to leave the park, turning onto the main road to go home. Now, as I'm leaving, I saw a person walking towards the main road from the road that ran right along the park. It looked like the same person as before, too, and it was definitely a man. He must have been visiting a friend or something, right? Even if that was the case, I crossed to the opposite side of the street so that I wouldn't pass directly by him. He didn't look particularly dangerous or unusual or anything, so sadly no weird, creepy, homeless-looking man for this story. I just got a bad feeling from him, I guess, which is probably what makes him even more terrifying, I suppose. He got to the intersection in any case before me, and he stopped. I passed by and glanced at the man, taking in what details that I could under the moonlight that came from between the tree branches. And, for all intents and purposes, he looked normal. He was probably an average height, wearing a pure white ball cap with no logos that casted a shadow over his face, and a pure white polo type shirt too. 
Strangely too, there wasn't a speck of dirt on this guy. He looked well kept and made the moonlight almost shine on him like some kind of ghost, which just added to my uneasy feeling. He watched me as I passed by and I tried to pretend that I didn't notice. I would occasionally look around as if I was just looking at the woods so I could see the man out of my peripheral vision. I didn't want or need to see the man in detail, partly because I was scared of the possibility of seeing something else too. Just because the man was much larger than me didn't mean that he wasn't probably armed too. In any case, once I was around 15 feet past the intersection, I did one of those glances and my stomach dropped as I saw him turn and start to follow me. Maybe he was just going for an extra long walk or something, right? He probably isn't following me, right? Then another thought popped into my mind and it sent my stomach to my feet. I'd been there for probably 10 minutes or so, singing after he passed. What if he wasn't visiting anyone? What if he was the thing that I saw just beyond the tree line? That's kind of obvious now that that was almost definitely the case, but let's be fair. When do 14-year-olds ever think through all the details of a situation completely during the situation? He was probably watching me the whole time, thinking back on it, and he could have snuck up and done who knows what at any time. I kept doing my glances though and noticed that he was getting closer and closer. I gripped my knife tighter, ready in case I had to use it. The chance of it going well wasn't the best, but it was a better chance than not trying at all. But obviously, I wanted that to be a last ditch option. I tried to make sure that it wasn't obvious, that I was keeping tabs on him that is. I didn't want him to get anxious and have him decide to speed up whatever his plan was. I was only halfway home and this was before I had surgery on my ankle too, so I was absolutely sure that he would catch me before I would reach my house if I started running where I was, so that wasn't an option whatsoever. I didn't have any current options though, so the one that I chose was just to bide my time until an opportunity opened up. I kept walking at a rather quick but unpanicked pace, keeping tabs on the man as he inched closer and kept an eye out for opportunities. And an opportunity came and it felt like it was sent from God himself. I saw headlights. A car was rolling towards me at a careful pace, which was normal considering the animals that I mentioned earlier. And it was Jem's dad. I recognized the shape of the lights and as the car got closer I became convinced that it was him. I was never so relieved to see that tiny white car ever and I tried signaling him without letting the man know I was but he just passed by. He must have thought that I was just saying hi, I suppose, in retrospect, but I glanced back again. And even though he didn't stop, he did exactly what I needed him to do. He slowed down a bit as he passed, and the man backed up a lot and crossed to the other side of the road. The headlights were on him, and he couldn't see me, at least for around five or six seconds. Maybe a bit longer, including readjusting to the dark. Either way, I walked faster and I didn't run, that way my steps wouldn't be too loud, but I ran to the corner before he'd be able to readjust and get sight of me again. And once I could turn and no longer see him, I quickly rushed home and I locked the door. I knew better than to leave it unlocked since, after all, I lived in the woods. Just because I couldn't see him anymore too didn't mean that he wasn't nearby and didn't mean that he couldn't see me. And, as stupid as this next part is, it's probably for the best that I did it. I texted Jem and I asked her to meet me outside right now because something happened and I needed to come over. She said okay and we both went outside and as soon as I saw her in her driveway, I sprinted to her house. I didn't want to be outside any longer than I had to be. She kept panicking and asked what happened and what was wrong and once I caught my breath, I told her everything. And right after I got done explaining, her dad walked in the house. He looked at Jem, seeming worried, and then noticed me hiding behind her. He looked relieved and told her that I was about to tell you to ask her to come over here, and I asked him if he saw the man following me, and he said that he did. He didn't really see his face, but that he was trying to make it look like he was on the phone, apparently, when he wasn't holding anything at all. But... That wasn't even close to the worst part. 
I think that this was the first time that I've ever seen this man scared, and I'm not sure I've ever seen fear like this from him since. He told us that the man apparently wasn't alone. You see, there's a gate at the front of where I live that needed a card to get in, and apparently there was another man outside that gate, who looked similar to the first, standing by a van. That meant that they didn't live there, didn't want security knowing that they were there, and wanted to get out quickly and quietly after they did whatever they were there for. Needless to say, I spent the night at Jem's that night, and I have no clue what would have happened had Jem's dad not driven by, or if I would have left at my normal time that night. So, when I, a female, was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city that I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck and my mum started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room for like $300 in a house, everything included. The homeowner was a man and he rented the additional rooms upstairs to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated that he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs and that he preferred women because he had issues with male roommates in the past partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mum and I went to the house to view it. It was a decent house and a decent neighbourhood too. He opened the door and was very welcoming he was middle-aged, and the kitchen and the living room were furnished really nicely and clean. My mum loves to talk and get to know people, so they were sort of engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said that he would show me my room. We head to the staircase to go up, as I thought, since he said on the phone that my room was upstairs with the other roommates. But he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens a door to a very small room no closet and no windows he proceeds to say that this is apparently my room and i'll be sharing the bathroom in the hallway with him and his bedroom did not have a door on it i was definitely thinking absolutely not this is weird but they were so deep in conversation that i really couldn't interject he then leads us to the upstairs and shows us the other rooms, which the doors were open and says that they're currently rented. He then starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women, not very nice stories too, describing like drinking problems and stuff like that. My mum was listening intently, but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three rooms and the bathrooms. There was furniture, but not a single item in there that looked like it belonged to a woman no clothes or anything only men's clothes in one of the closets he had no problem with me creeping around his tenant's room without their permission i then heard him tell my mum that he has some of his stuff in their closets but they don't mind and i'm just like uh, why the heck would a tenant pay you for you to use their space as storage i was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked my mum had mentioned when we arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation the next week, but I couldn't go because I had to work. He brought it up again and that I should come by next week and have dinner with him and the roomies to see if we would all get along. I said sure to this and we just left. As soon as we got in the car, I told my mum that I would definitely not be living there. She was dumbfounded. I had to explain to her not only did he lie about the room that I would be in, that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him as well as share a bathroom with him, and he didn't even have a door, but also did she not notice how no one else even lived there? She still didn't get it and thought that I was just being paranoid and thought that he was nice and it was a cheap deal. In the end too, I had to explain it to my stepdad and get him to tell her by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time that we got home that day, he had removed it. I think that 
He may have been planning on doing something at dinner or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room that had no way to escape. Also, but before I finish, I would just like to add some details. So, this happened in 2011, so it's been quite a while. When he took us upstairs, there was a wide landing that was surrounded by the rooms. And as soon as we got up there, he motions towards one of the rooms and started this long, intricate story about the woman who lived in there and talking about her alcoholism and a crazy ex. He was very exaggerated in how he talked with a, a lot of gestures. My mum stood there listening the whole time. I don't know if it was sheer distraction or she just didn't want to be rude, like not listening and all, but either way, I don't recall her ever having a good look around those rooms. I went and looked, obviously. All the doors were open, had neatly made beds with dark wood bed frames, mirrors, nightstands, stuff like that. There were sliding mirror closets and they were completely empty except for one had men's clothes hanging pushed against one corner. Nothing was on the nightstands other than a lamp and nothing on the bureaus. I went into the bathrooms and there was nothing on the vanity in them other than like hand soap I guess. I looked in the showers too, but nothing other than bar soap. The bedroom on the left had an empty suitcase laying open in the middle of the bed. This was one of the rooms with the empty closet. But after seeing all this, I came back onto the landing and started slowly heading down the stairs. They were still talking and absentmindedly followed me down to the living room. That's when he mentioned dinner and we left shortly after and I think that's why my mum didn't notice a lot and didn't believe me at first. She didn't take more than a quick glance upstairs, and when we were in the basement, he was sort of just as talkative, I guess. Someone who works in law enforcement pointed out once to me that this was probably actually a, a sex trafficking situation. The bedroom in the basement is where a victim is likely kept, drugged and abused until broken and then trafficked. I honestly think that this is more plausible with the situation, as well as my city is actually a hotspot for that. I honestly think too that this is more plausible with the situation as well as my city is actually a hotspot for this. I'm just grateful that we got out of there in the end and I hope my experience could help someone one day notice the details and get out of the situation safely. Like I said, this guy was obviously lying about a lot of things. There was nobody else in that house and if I had taken it and been the only one there with him... Who knows what would have happened. I'm going to try to keep this brief as I have this memory burned into my brain with great detail. I'll try to summarize it. So I was about six or seven years old and my mother and I were on a routine grocery run to our local Walmart. I remember getting out of the car and walking up to the entrance. We had parked sort of off in the back, so we had a little walk to the front. As we walk up, I see a homeless man asking for change from every person that walks by. He asks the woman in front of us for change, and as she turns him down, he scoffs and begins to say something rude at the woman. My mother and I walked past him with haste to avoid conflict, as he seems to be extremely agitated. We get inside and get our groceries and everything is fine. As we load up and begin to leave, I remember my mother pulling out $2 to specifically give the man as he is presumably still at the entrance begging. My mother, trying to avoid conflict, wants to hand him the money and be on our way so we don't end up getting harassed as the woman before us did. As we walk out, I sort of raise my arms up to my mother in a little kid fashion to be picked up as I'm obviously scared of the encounter that we're about to have with this guy. My mother picks me up and we begin to leave the store. Before the man can even ask us for the money, my mother hands him the cash and we walk away conflict-free. I'm being held by my mother at this point with my head facing behind her. And as we're about halfway to our car, I look up from the pavement and look at the man who is now staring directly at me with the most sinister face that I've ever seen. His features are distorted, and what I can only describe as demonic. He's smiling and sticking his tongue out, but his tongue was almost to his chest. 
he lets out this long hiss as his eyes roll into the back of his head, seemingly invisible to the other people passing him. I still to this day do not understand too how I was so far away but heard his hiss as if it was right next to my ear. I'm sure that it could all be just dismissed as a homeless guy that was on drugs but I truly think that this was a demon. It messed me up for a really long time and to this day it's a big factor in my belief of the paranormal. This happened uh, a little while back now when I was 15. I had just discovered the rebellious act of sneaking out. This was probably my fourth or fifth time doing it, I think. And this one night, I decided to go and meet up with my boyfriend. At this point in time, we weren't really together, but we liked each other. And you know how that goes. When you're with someone that you like, you tend to not really pay attention to what's going on around you. The night starts out fine though and we're having a good time. I don't remember exactly what we were talking about because we had gotten pretty high but I do remember what happened. We'd met up and gone to this elementary school that had a decent sized field with some hills and trees towards the end. It's important for me to explain this in order for you to understand how things went down too so bear with me here. So from where you're sitting we had a very clear view of the school as well as the school's basketball court. The school was illuminated from the side lights, so we could easily see if anyone walked by, but it wasn't necessarily easy for people to see us. And to our left was a little pavement path that led into a townhouse complex. So, we're just sitting there at the edge of this field, looking at the stars and talking about random stuff, when we start to hear the crunch of gravel coming from the school. But because we're high and paranoid, we immediately turn our attention to the illuminated basketball court. And we watch as this guy just walks by with his bike and doesn't seem to notice us. After he passes, we almost instantly forget about it and resume talking, laughing and just being generally a bit loud. Perhaps 10 minutes later, we hear that same crunch of gravel, so we go silent and look towards the school. Once again, it's the bike guy, but this time, once he reaches the basketball court, he doesn't keep walking. Instead, he stops at the edge of the field that we're sitting on and just stares out at it for maybe a minute or so, kind of like he was looking for us. We're a little bit creeped out at this point, so we start packing our things to leave. Then this dude begins walking towards us. Once he stepped out onto the field too, it became much more difficult to see him as the light from the school only lit so much up. But we take this as our cue to leave though and... The only way to leave without being extremely visible is to take the path into the townhouses. So that's what we do. We try our best to be quiet, obviously, and we walk through the pitch black path that leads to the townhouse complex. Keep in mind that we are not sober, so we're extra freaked out. I check behind us constantly and for some reason just could not shake the feeling that something bad was going to happen. We finally reach the end of the pitch black path and make it into the decently lit townhouse complex. We ease up a little bit at this point and begin trying to find our way to the main entrance or exit because that's the closest way out besides the way that we came in. We're walking through the complex and start talking once more and finally we turn the corner to leave and just as we're about to leave we see this same guy with his bike right at the entrance. We all stop for maybe two seconds and then this guy drops his bike and darts right at us insanely quickly. I mutter a quick, oh no, and my boyfriend and I begin sprinting as fast as we can away from this guy. But we turn the random corners and go down little back alleys, not once checking behind ourselves. I don't know when or where we lost this guy, but when we became tired and took a stop behind some bushes, we both noticed that there was no man in sight. We stay in this same position for... Uh, about 20 minutes I would guess, trying to calm down a bit. At this point, we're both pretty much sobered up, so we decide to try and leave again. We begin walking through the complex once more, and when we make our way back to the main entrance, we both see that guy's bike is now gone. 
We're both unsettled by this because now we know that he's no longer in the townhouse complex. But we have no clue where this guy is too or if he's just going to randomly appear again. Luckily for us, we both made it home safe that night but I'll never forget that feeling of my heart sinking when we saw the bike guy blocking our way out. It was by far one of the creepiest things that I've ever experienced and I often wonder what that guy wanted. Our McDonald's pre-global panini by several years was a 24-hour store. As my wife worked until 3am and I was on her sleep schedule so she wouldn't be lonely, about 4am we were hungry and decided to grab some food. We ordered and were waiting at the window when we saw this guy walk up. I'm getting the nastiest feeling coming over me though and dread, despair, terror. I wanted to bolt from our car and run for my life. The guy though just casually walked to the restaurant and when he passed under the street lights, I saw this thing floating behind him. It was freaky about six feet tall, all black except for a large white face. The face had dark sunken eyes and multiple sharp teeth poking out between its lips. It had long arms with clawed hands on the man's shoulder and below the hips it just sort of dissipated. So no legs. My wife hasn't said anything and usually isn't sensitive to the paranormal so I really didn't expect anything. But as the man walked out of the light, the thing vanished from sight and I heard our car doors lock. I looked at my wife who was pale and wide-eyed. She just goes, tell me you saw that. I confirmed and we just sort of sat and watched the guy continue his walk and into the restaurant. Seeing it though was just, I don't know, crazy and scary. The fact that my wife could also see it was absolutely terrifying to me. Also, I just want to say that what I saw, I didn't speak about until she said her piece. I didn't want to influence her and that's the way that she prefers it, to be honest. So what my wifey says that she saw was a, a large black shape with wispy ends below the waist instead of legs. She didn't say that she saw the face, but she described the long arms and clawed hands. She said that she'd started paying attention because she felt nauseous and uneasy when the guy started walking up and that she was worried about him trying to come up to our car since he was acting like he was severely angry. Anyway, I don't know what I saw that night, but it is something that I'll never forget. So this happened about four years ago. My dad works nights, so I'm home alone until about 2.30 in the morning most days. We live in a pretty quiet area where people usually keep to themselves. But one night at about uh, maybe one in the morning, there was a knock at the door, and when I checked our peephole, there was a young woman with a car parked near the curb in front of my house. I answered, and she looked really young, Maybe 15 or 16 or just looked very youthful I guess. In short she looked just barely old enough to be driving. She told me that she was having car trouble though and asked if I could come and check it out and possibly give her a car jump. At this time I didn't drive, have a car of my own or knew very much about cars so I was of little help to be honest but offered to call someone if she needed AAA or a tow service. She declined but kept insisting that I check out the lights on her dashboard to see if it was normal. At this point, I just didn't want to be outside with a stranger, so I politely informed her that I'd be of little help because I had no knowledge of cars. I went back inside but kept looking through the peephole. And then I noticed that she opened the back door to the car, got into the back seat of it, and the car drove off. And it instantly made my stomach drop and had me extremely freaked out. I was kind of distraught thinking about what the real reason was to approach my house like that and even who was driving. Just the entire thing left me confused and frightened. I spent the next few days a little on edge because I was afraid that they may return knowing that someone is there or that I was alone. I also think of that girl and who she was. 
I wish I had a video doorbell at the time so I could find out if she was a victim of some sort or something. I don't know. But the whole thing still bothers me a lot and it was just a really eerie night. So, I live in a county that was pretty rural until the last 10 or 15 years. The biggest town in our county is pretty crowded now though, and overcrowded in fact, and I hate it. But I moved from there to the countryside. I, I like where I live, except it can be really creepy at nights, I guess, because for miles and miles it's just dark and no streetlights. Anyway... One thing about this county is that the main roads, they always get backed up real quick. Or there's an accident or whatever, so it really pays to go to the back roads. But the back roads, like any other rural place, are less populated, dark, lots of trees, and no sidewalks. And a few years ago, something happened that almost made me stop using them. So I was driving home kind of late one night... I decided to take one particular back road that shaved off like 10 minutes from my commute home. I was tired and had to get up early, so I was just going fast trying to get home soon. This road is a, a little more populated than some, but it is super spooky in some stretches because there's these huge trees that are along the side of the road and their branches and leaves make a tunnel of sorts. But I'm just sort of zipping through and around a curve, and up ahead I see what I thought was a giant garden flag... You know the flags that people put up in the spring in the yards? Well, I thought it was a weird flag because it seemed like it was fairly tall and large and it was right in the middle of the road. As I get closer, my headlights hit it and it's not a flag. It's a person. A lady. She was wearing a red fez. I live in rural Maryland. You just don't see a fez every day. A long, flowy white dress and an orange reflective sash across her chest. It was a little strange because, I mean, she's in the middle of the street. But as I drove past her, man, it got so much weirder. As dark as it was, as I drove by, I could see that she was about 60. She had glasses and I could see her bright blue eyes. She looked in my passenger window and then she started doing this weird bounce thing is the only way that I can describe it. I thought that she was going to try and get into my car to be honest. Mind you, I'm going pretty fast. I don't know what it was about her though, but she freaked me out, man. I didn't think that she would rob me. I really thought that she was just a... I know this sounds crazy, but a soul snatcher or a skinwalker or something like that. I honestly didn't think that she was human. I know that that's going to be hard for some people to believe, but I can't adequately describe just how creepy this woman was. I sped past her at any rate as fast as I could. I kept glancing in my back seat to make sure that she had not materialized in my car. I prayed, recited scripture, and kept watching in my rearview mirror. It was spring, so it was a little warm, but man, I just felt bone-chillingly cold. I finally make it home though and I run in to tell my mum the story and I got in just as my brother was telling my mum about this weird lady that he saw as he was driving and it turned out to be the same lady but he saw her at the intersection from the highway and the back road whereas I saw her further down the road. We both had the same reaction though and she also tried looking into his car. She was also bouncing around when he saw her too and he said that there was a car in front of him too that sped off just as quickly when they drove past this lady as well. well. My brother was so freaked out that he won't actually travel that road anymore during the day even. Eventually though, I found out that the lady, she lives in the woods there. Apparently at one time her family lived on that road. Her father was ill and she tried to take him to the hospital. He apparently died on the way there and she drove around with his body in her car for like hours. I don't know. I guess that she has mental health issues and I think she lost the house or got kicked out or something. I have friends that live off of that street so when I was talking about it they knew exactly who it was. I still go on that road but 
I haven't seen her since, thankfully. I do hope that she's okay, but I really do not want to run into her again like that. So, if you guys don't know where Costa Rica is, it's a little, really tiny country located in Central America. Even though the country is small and you can travel from coast to coast in like half a day, there are some places that due to the dense rainforest and jungle, traveling to those places can take many hours. And this is the case of the province of Limon, located at the Caribbean coast of the country. So yesterday, I had to travel to Le Mans because a friend of mine sold his pickup truck to a guy from there and he needed to deliver it to him, so obviously he needed transport on the way back. We went there and we did the sale, all went as planned, and after doing that, we thought that it wouldn't be a bad idea to go and visit some beaches, so we did that. Long story short, the night fell upon us and we needed to quickly go back to the city, but it was like a four or five hour drive and we didn't have that time because in Costa Rica, due to the COVID cases, we have restrictions on the use of vehicles from 9pm to 5am. So, in an attempt to not get caught by the police, I decided to take an old road through the mountains instead of going through the highway Route 32. So like around 9.30pm I started the mountain route. To be honest too I was sort of hyped to drive there because mountain roads are fun to drive in my opinion and they also have a bit of a chill vibe. But anyway around 10.30pm me and my friend were listening to music and having a chat while driving when what appeared to be another car going fast started tailgating us. I started going faster in an attempt to lose the other car but it just didn't work. The car kept tailgating me and was literally driving in the same way as me. Same speed, same braking, same way of cornering. That was really weird and a little bit scary to be honest. It was my friend who actually noticed that first. The car kept tailgating me for like 15 to 20 minutes though and as I said earlier, we were driving through an old mountain road so the pavement was in a really bad condition. After my friend told me to slow down, I listened, so I put on my emergency lights, slowed down and tried to give space and signals to the car that was tailgating to overtake me. But instead, the car started honking aggressively. I got a little bit mad, so I started going fast again. At this point, I thought the people in that car were trying to steal my car, so I was worried too. The mysterious car kept following me though until we arrived at a bridge. In the middle of the bridge... The lights of the car that was tailgating just suddenly disappeared. The car just sort of vanished. I thought that the car had an accident, so at the end of the bridge I parked the car on the side of the road and started looking. I even took a flashlight to see if it fell into the river or crashed into the sides of the bridge or something, but when I did, there was nothing. What I mean is that the car that was tailgating and following me for like an hour just completely vanished. Obviously, I was terrified, so I ran into my car and drove as fast as I could to get home. Also, the car looked like a sort of 90s white Corolla or Nissan Sentra from what I could see. So that was suspicious from the beginning because how in the world an old sedan would go up the same speed as a BMW M3 on the uphill was just sort of impossible to be honest. Me and my friend still really can't find an explanation on how that happened and we were just so confused. Anyway, let me know what you think or if you've had similar experiences with ghost cars like this because it's something that has me scratching my head. Several months ago, I shared my experience with an unwelcome visitor who knocks on our windows late at night and plays carnival music. This is an update on that situation as a lot of people have requested it. So shortly after sharing my first story, I had almost convinced myself our intruder was gone when, as I was staying up in the early hours of the morning to finish a bit of homework, I heard a noise in the yard just outside of my bedroom. I sat there listening, but could only detect something like machinery. 
It was not a sound that I recognized. I couldn't imagine what was causing the noise unless the air conditioning was misbehaving or something. But once it had quieted down, I finished working and I went to sleep. About two nights later, I would guess, I heard a loud grinding around the same hour, but again just couldn't determine the source, however alarming the volume was. And the following morning, my father discovered that someone had sabotaged our air conditioning unit by first removing a piece of its inner machinery and later throwing it into the fan while it was spinning, effectively destroying its blades and a few other pieces. The part that had presumably been taken the first time I was disturbed by the activity in the yard, it was allegedly thrown back in the second time. I had noticed it only because the outdoor unit is mounted against my bedroom. But we thought initially that the piece, and forgive me for the ambiguous language as I'm not very technologically savvy, had loosened by itself and broken down, but we called our repairman who begged to differ. He was actually surprised by the degree of damage and insisted that he had never seen it happen naturally, suspecting that someone had removed several screws and tampered with the unit. He thought my father had attempted to work on it and caused the trouble, but of course he hadn't. A few days after the damaged parts had been fully replaced, my mother was leaving for a doctor's appointment when she began yelling and called the family into the yard. Our electric box was open in the night and left ajar as if someone had been trying to find a wire to cut our electricity or disable a suspected indoor security system. We had been outside several times since the repairman finished his work and we're certain that he closed the electric box if he ever even opened it. We have weathered several severe hurricanes here and winds are not strong enough to open our electric box, which means that a person had to have done it. Anyway, weeks passed without incident, my parents opting to overlook these concerning happenings. My father tried to explain the air conditioner is a freak occurrence, and they purchased a new gun and did little else. Towards the beginning of summer though, my grandfather mentioned that a couple of weeks prior, when we were in vacation, he'd seen a red jeep drive the lengthy distance from the road through our private property to our house in broad daylight. He didn't recognize the driver, but approached and questioned him. The man claimed that he was looking for a woman that lived in a trailer. The person he claimed that he was looking for had the name of a family friend that lived hours away from us. But the man was behaving strangely and my grandfather was not convinced by his story. He ordered him to leave immediately. Our family that lives around us on the farm is reinforcing their doors, installing extra locks and keeping their children out of the yards until we find out what's going on. They won't even let them walk home from the bus stop anymore. But I had stopped worrying over it as much because I've been preoccupied with moving to a new state. But unfortunately, the old knocking return this evening at 10 p.m. My parents were watching television together when they heard it and they turned on the porch light and peered out the peephole of the back door to investigate but they saw no one. At 3 a.m. I was awake watching television when it sounded as if someone forcefully punched the glass of the usually exposed window. I covered it with a blanket as I always do and an hour after I covered the window... I began to hear loud noises from our back door porch of the kitchen, as if someone had stepped onto it. However, it was briefly lived. They apparently weren't walking around, but just simply standing there. About ten minutes after, I heard yet more knocking, except this time it wasn't on the exposed living room window, but further down the wall the window was on, next to the couch that is. It was three knocks, forceful enough to rattle the wall a bit, but not so much the couch moved. This is obviously more alarming because it suggests the trespasser lingers here for several hours at a time, which poses more questions. Like, are we being watched for an opportunity to force entry? Hasn't the opportunity already arisen in the past and they never took it? Are we being stalked? Do they gather here to drink and get high on the property or something and then decide in their stupor that it will be funny to antagonize us? Why is it only our house that is targeted and not the other houses on the farm? Why do they walk several miles to come here? Whatever the case, their behavior is escalating and will they eventually take things further? I don't know. 
I woke up my mother though and we sat awake together until the sun rose just to keep watch. We compiled a list of happenings here that suggest too that our trespasser visits more frequently than they knock. Despite no one in the family smoking and anyone who does smoke lives too far away for us to smell it, we often deal with the strong scent of a cigarette around windows or the front back doors of the house and stuff like that. This happens at our bedroom windows with alarming regularity too. Other times it's a strange cologne or chemical stench like a fresh perm sort of thing. We of course remembered how my aunt's dogs will bark intensely at odd hours of the night like they do when a stranger visits and the motion detecting yard light has previously come on when no one is home at my grandfather's too so all of this stuff really tells a bit of a story. My mother and I are going to walk around the perimeter of the house in the morning to look for cigarette butts and we'll try convincing my father that we at least need security cameras outside, even though I think that we should involve the police at this point. He's been too indifferent to everything that's happened so far and it makes it challenging to be proactive about our safety. He's hoping that nothing bad happens before, well, we figure out what's going on. In late May, I decided to take a trip to London for a long weekend, and I stayed at an Airbnb for the first time. It was a nice detached house, slightly away from the usual hustle and bustle of busy London roads. And the first day was, well, all well and good. In the morning, I left to explore the city, and when I came back to the Airbnb, I found it weird how the entry lights were on, as I'm vigilant with turning off lights when leaving. It's almost like a muscle memory nowadays, wherever I am. However, I was a bit tipsy that night and decided to just put that thought to the back of my mind and I went to bed. So the next morning I got up and I left to do some more exploring. I came back home in the late evening and when I stepped through the door, the front lights weren't on this time. But what I did find strange was how the window near the front door had its blinds drawn to the side when they were previously closed for as long as I had been staying there. As I made my way to the kitchen, I came in to find a half-full glass of cola on the countertop, alongside a dirty dish in the sink. Now, you may think that it was mine and maybe I just forgot. However, I know that I had cleaned up after cooking breakfast that day, and the remainder of what was in that bowl looked like cereal, which I didn't have that morning. I wasn't planning on making excuses though, and I trust my instincts, so I promptly left the premise and I contacted my host. He came down rather quickly as I hung around the closest bus stop. When he got there, we went in together, and I told him that I was concerned that someone had gotten in when I was away or something. He was thankfully very empathetic and understanding of my concerns. He then decided to remotely check the camera footage, and whilst rewinding, he caught a man wearing a backpack entering through the back bathroom window through the garden, then leaving about two hours later through the front entry window, which when we checked, was still unlocked. Remember how I said that it was odd that the blinds were drawn back on that window? Police were called and we both filled in our statements and from what I know, he has since taken that property down from his Airbnb page and it's not been back on since. I've not been contacted by the police after the initial report either so honestly I can't even tell if he's been caught or not or if the host had any further footage of this man coming in and out. I'm just really glad that I didn't come face to face with this guy because who knows what would have happened. This is a, a bit of a long one, so strap in. So, I've always been a bit of a skeptic, I guess, when it comes to the paranormal and stuff like that. My family is religious, don't get me wrong, and believes in spirits and demons, and I do as well, but I never exactly bought into any of the actual stories of entities inhabiting houses and stuff like that. Now, however, I'm not so skeptical anymore. If anything... I'm downright terrified because I still have no idea what really happened. My boyfriend came over last night to watch a movie and chill. Nothing out of the ordinary. 
I'm currently dog sitting for some neighbors down the street. Nothing big. I've done it quite a few times for them before, so I know the routine and everything. I never really felt nervous at night or anything, so everything was normal. At around 10 p.m. though, my boyfriend and I left the house to go walk the dog. It was dark out and we were just chatting as we went down the street. But we approached the driveway and I just got this really weird feeling in my stomach. But I chalked it up to being a stomach cramp and just continued up the driveway. I opened the garage door and walked inside. And as I'm walking in, my boyfriend just stopped dead in his tracks in the middle of the garage. I kind of assumed that he just didn't want to go in since it's an unfamiliar house and all, so I continued on. There's these sort of two-layered doors leading into the house, a big wooden one followed by a glass door, and I opened the wooden door and instantly just got this weird feeling in my gut. Let me preface this too by saying that I personally am not a fan of the dark and prefer to keep the lights on, especially when I'm alone in somebody else's house. And for this exact reason, I always made sure to keep a few lights on in the house, for when I went to dog sit at night, that is. As I opened the glass door, though, I quickly realized that every single light in the house was now off. The only sliver of light that I could see was coming from the closed bathroom door. I murmured something about it to my boyfriend, who also noticed the bathroom light and was still standing in the garage. I finally stepped inside the house and instantly faltered. The atmosphere was just, and I know this is going to sound weird to some people, but just so oppressive. I felt extremely vulnerable and exposed the second that I walked in there. Now, the dog's kennel and food is directly to the left of the door, so I turned to go take her out. As I was getting ready to open her kennel door, I just got this inexplainable urge to look behind me. Turning around, I stared directly into the empty and dark living room, and my heart just instantly stopped. I felt waves of nausea and fear started to wash over me. It was like something was just staring right back at me from within the darkness. The raw primal fear was something that I've never felt before. It felt as if whatever it was was watching me from there and just waiting for the chance to hurt me. Every instinct in my body was screaming at me to just run and just get out of there. But my boyfriend was saying things to me from the doorway, but I genuinely couldn't understand him because I was just too scared to take anything in, I guess. Eventually, I finally turned to look at my boyfriend, who stared straight back at me and whispered that we needed to go right then and there. He looked like he was about to throw up, and I could tell from the look on his face that he was feeling the exact same fear that I was. I quickly opened the kennel as fast as I could, grabbed the dog, and we just bolted. I was instinctively tearing up as we left the garage from pure fear as well, and I could tell my boyfriend was too. We waited until we were at the entrance of the driveway to even risk talking. Eventually, when we did start talking, my boyfriend told me how he felt like something was horribly wrong in that house, and that he'd felt as if he was about to vomit from fear and nausea, I got even more freaked out hearing him describe the same symptoms that I felt. If I'd been the only one to experience this, I probably would have chalked it up to simple fear of the dark reaction, but hearing his words just made it so much worse. At first I was assuming that this was a part of a home invasion, convinced that someone was waiting in the dark with a gun. I contacted the owner of the house who confirmed that they owned automatic lights, but they shouldn't have all gone off like that. Truly wonderful words to ease my fears, right? I then called my mum, who was still at our house, telling her what happened as we walked the dog down the street. My boyfriend was attempting to calm himself down as I talked, and I think we were both just super shaken up at this point. It honestly felt like we had escaped a near-death experience. After some persuasion, though, she agreed to go back to the house with us to help us check everything out, but it was clear that she didn't exactly believe us. To be honest though, I didn't care. I just wanted to have an extra person with me in case of a home intruder or something. See, I didn't really think it could have been anything paranormal at that point. I was just terrified that there was someone in that house with a weapon. She walked with us back to the house and we explained the terror that we'd felt inside the house and our gut feeling to instantly book it. 
We approached and walked up the driveway cautiously, carefully looking for any signs of break-in, and as we finally approached the garage door, however, the dog just started going absolutely crazy, like wild, snarling and growling at the garage door like something was on the other side. And the fear and the nausea came back in full force, to the point where I just couldn't stop crying. The tears were just coming down my face, and the closer that I got to the garage door, the worse it felt. I practically begged my mum to back up from the garage door and she just seemed pretty concerned at this point and contacted the owner again as the dog continued to growl. After a quick conversation, we all eventually decided to open the garage with bated breath. And when we did, nobody was inside. Walking into the house now, I felt the terrifying presence fade a bit, but the atmosphere was still just really eerie and unsettling. We turned the lights on and after a few moments of tense silence sort of relaxed, the dog ran to her food bowl and all seemed to be calm. And then my boyfriend pointed out that the bathroom light, which had previously been on, was off. The door was also cracked slightly open. We sort of nervously laughed about it and after the dog finished eating, I went to put her back in her kennel. The door to the kennel, though, was now let shut. And I knew that I hadn't shut it when we left, and just pushing it closed wouldn't have been enough to completely latch it shut. It's one of those dog kennel doors that you need to push the latch into sort of two directions to properly close it. That cold chill came back to me then, and I shared a worried glance with my boyfriend. My mom then abruptly stood up and announced that it was time for us to leave. We all walked to the back of the house in relative silence and my boyfriend and I just kind of cuddled for the rest of the night. He mentioned that he felt like the experience was supernatural or paranormal and to be honest, I agreed with him. I mean, there were no signs of a robber or anything. It definitely felt like some kind of malicious entity, but I don't know, maybe it wasn't. Everything that happened was just so surreal and... I'm not even sure anymore. I get chills just thinking about it though and I guess I'm just wondering if anyone has had an experience like this before. Could it have been some sort of a, a demon or something? Or do you think it was a break-in or something? Any advice or shared experiences would be helpful as I really just cannot find much online. Thank you. I grew up in an eight-bedroom farmhouse with my dad until I grew up and moved out. We always had extra rooms not being used, and because of the age of the house plus all this extra space, there was always just uh, an eeriness, like someone was looming in the shadows. If I had to get a drink in the middle of the night, for instance, I would always look at the ground the whole time because I was scared of what may be looking back at me from the dark corners, the rooms, and the hallways. Even the windows and the mirrors were avoided because I wasn't sure what I'd actually see looking back at me. Anyway, when I was around 12 years old, I questioned why the room that used to be my nursery was locked from the inside. I didn't think that it was weird before then. My dad needed a room for storage and all that, and I figured that he just wanted to keep me out or something. But I brought it up to him one day, asking what's so important in there that he needs to keep me out, even though I'm not a child anymore. A typical 12-year-old mentality, right? Turns out, though, that I was not entirely correct about the lock. My dad, with a very serious demeanor, sat me down and answered my inquiry. When I was a baby, maybe one or two years old, I slept in this nursery room on the second floor next to my dad's room. And this room was painted by my sister, especially for me, with Winnie the Pooh characters and fluffy clouds, the type of thing that I think back on and appreciate. The effort and the creativity was really admirable, I think. I have a photo of me smiling at Pooh Bear on the wall, actually, while we were setting it up. Anyway, I was in this nursery in my crib, again right next to my dad's room, the perfect age to be on my own. Every night, though, my dad was woken up by my scream crying. He had raised four children before me, so he was not making the first-time parent mistakes that would otherwise be in question. 
He thought that it was probably just the switch to me being in my own room rather than being in his room that caused my nightly discomfort. He considered bringing my crib back into his room, but of course the nursery was all ready to go. I mean, I had just graduated to my own big kid room. For a while, when I cried in terror, he would come in and check on me, only to find that nothing was wrong in the sense of, like, present stresses like temperature, diaper change, hungry or thirsty, etc. He would stay with me until I fell asleep or keep the light on to make me feel safer and then return to his room to get some actual rest. One night, though, after finally having enough of my distress, he decided to camp out on the floor of my nursery to see if he could figure out what the matter was but mostly to try and sleep through the night too. And this was the last time that anyone ever slept in that room. So I was able to doze off now that I wasn't alone. He, on the other hand, was tossing and turning on the hardwood floor, not comfortable enough to sleep. And as he laid there on the floor, mulling over the situation, there were three huge bangs that jolted him to his feet by a few massive blows to the floorboards beneath him, centered directly on his back, as if someone on the first floor was battering a ram aimed at the ceiling. His first instinct was to run downstairs and check for intruders. He's a man of logic after all, brave and ready to defend his family. However, when he got down there, the lights were off. There was no one downstairs. The front door was locked, windows locked, no sign of forced entry. No one else lived with us. Our closest neighbor was down the road like a quarter mile, and why would they break in just to bang on the ceiling, let alone have mapped it out where my dad would be sleeping in my nursery that night? And the other thing was that the force of the blows, this wasn't normal blows. This actually moved to the floorboards. After this event, though, my dad brought my crib back into his bedroom and I was able to sleep without crying or screaming beyond needing a diaper change or something normal like that. He brought the Bible into the nursery for extra measure and casted out any evil that may have invited itself in there. He locked up that nursery and only used it for storage after that and only went in during the daytime. And to this day, that old lock is still on that door. As if a, a lock will keep spirits locked in, right? Short of pretending that experience never happened, he couldn't rationalize it enough to do anything else. But we think that the entity was evil and malicious, and when my dad tried protecting me, this only made it worse. As I grew up in that house, I had a really hard time sleeping in any room of my own, Many nights I ended up rushing to the couch in the living room, turning on the TV and watching Disney till I fell asleep again. But even then I was just not comfortable. There were always just what felt like eyes on me. There were many more unexplained events from that farmhouse, but this was the most direct encounter with evil that my dad has ever had. When I was in the 11th grade, I had this taxi driver who would drive me to school and drop me off at home every day. He seemed nice at first, and we always had some pretty good conversations. For the first few weeks, he was actually one of my favorite people. Just seemed like a cool guy in general. But then one day, things started to get a bit weird. He started telling me stories about what happens to girls on dark web videos and... I just stayed completely silent because, I mean, what the heck, right? Then he gave me a pair of his glasses, made me try them on and everything. Actually made me try on several pairs, I mean, and he even put his hand on my leg multiple times and actually had the audacity to give me his number at Facebook, completely without me prompting it. Let me just remind you all that at this time I was 17 and this dude was like in his 40s and had a wife and kids and everything. Along with that too, though, he kept begging me to let him teach me karate at his house. So, all of these things kept happening over the course of about a month. The tipping point, though, is when he actually sent me a message on Facebook telling me how beautiful I looked in a picture. I told my parents, which I should have done ages before that, and I blocked him. My parents proceeded to call the taxi company to report him. And the kicker is that this particular taxi service was specifically for minors going to school. 
but wait, there's more to this. So about a month goes by after that. I got a different driver who was actually much better and not creepy at all. Things were fine too until I walked out of school one day and the creepy taxi driver was right there in the parking lot in his car waiting for me. But because I didn't know that it was him, I went right up to the car to get in. Obviously when I saw his face, I stopped myself and said, Oh sorry, I forgot something and ran back into the school. He didn't look normal that day either. His eyes were red as if he'd been on drugs and his beard was completely full when he always kept it shaved. He kept making strange grunting noises in the few seconds that I was there too. My parents were obviously furious that he showed up like that and called the taxi company again. The manager of that company said that it was probably just an accident in their system but I don't believe them at all. I honestly feel like if I had gotten in that car that day that... I probably wouldn't be here. I'm 18 now, but from ages 3 to 11, my family and I lived in a large four-bedroom Victorian home. It wasn't really the location that you would expect a haunted house to be in. I mean, we were right next to the busy street, in a row of other houses. All very old though, but... The house had three floors, as the attic had been converted into two bedrooms, and a large walk-in storage cupboard that separated the two rooms. I lived with my three older half-siblings, and so it was very common for us to swap rooms every few months. I'd slept in every room by this point, my parents' room quite often as I was terrified every night, but more on that later. The large room opposite theirs, and the two attic rooms as well. Each one seemed to have its own different type of horrors or whatever it was, but for the first few years I was too terrified to sleep on my own as a kid. I barely slept actually, and when I did I suffered from terrible nightmares, so I would sleep in a camp bed in their room. That was where I had my first encounter with sleep paralysis too. I couldn't have been older than six I would guess, but I still remember it vividly. A small boy with a paper bag over his head seemed to emerge seemingly from the wall next to my mother's side of the bed and slowly but surely was walking around their bed towards me. I remember looking to my side and there was what I can only describe as a tall black stick figure, like one of those drawings who was looking like above me. I couldn't move, I was sweating profusely but I knew that I was awake. The next thing I knew, he was crouching down to me and the boy had reached the foot of my bed. It was at that moment that I managed to let out a scream, and I've never had anything as vivid as that again, but I'll never forget it. When I was seven or eight, I started wanting to have my own room. I did a lot of reading to distract myself from the fear and often would stay up till the early hours reading, too terrified to sleep, but waking up in the morning with my book still in my arms. I was given one of the attic rooms, and by that point, my older sister had the room opposite mine, but she had gone off to university, and so I was alone up there. I would never dare sleep without the light on, and to be honest, old habits never really die, as even now I still sleep with the light, unless I'm with my boyfriend, of course. Most nights would be me reading as long as I could until I just had to close my eyes. It was then, though, that the voices would always start up. Like, there was a couple arguing in the hall. On some of the worst nights, I swear that I could hear breathing coming from under my bed as well. It came to a point where I was just so scared that I had to have my dog and cat sleep in my room with me, but they couldn't settle either. My dog would just keep crying and my cat was constantly spooked. They hated being in there, so I had no choice but to remain alone in there. And the night terrors continued. I'd wake up and just couldn't stand to be in my room anymore, so I'd creep down to the second floor and sleep outside my parents' room. I don't know how I even functioned with so little sleep, to be honest, but that was just life. Most times I couldn't have sleepovers too, as my friends would complain of being scared and hearing things. My siblings had similar experiences, and when my sister had her friend over, often her friend would recount waking up in the night, and my sister was sitting up in bed, still asleep, but talking to the dark corner. My brother would have his own covers pulled off of him in the night, and my other sister recalled her toes being pinched while sleeping. 
Everyone had their own experiences in that house, even non-believers too. My dad recounted being locked out of the house from the outside when he went out to the garden one time, even though he was the only one home, seeing a dark shadow glide next to the door as he struggled to open it too. Sometimes I would be sitting outside my parents' room at like 3 in the morning and I would hear the cutlery drawer downstairs being shaken, the TV being turned on for a split second and then off again, even though everyone was asleep. I couldn't do anything in that house without the feeling of being watched too. If I was alone in that house, I would stay out in the garden the whole time. Even then, I felt extremely uneasy. I would just sit on my trampoline and feel like a pair of eyes were watching me from like the living room window that looked out into the garden. Our elderly neighbor told my father the backstory of the house one time when my dad would sometimes recount the strange occurrences going on in the house. And he told us that years before we moved in, there lived a, a very reclusive middle-aged woman known to be very cold and unwelcoming. She didn't leave often, only to go to work as a gym teacher. She was known to be sadistic and cruel to the children that she taught though, and he mentioned something extremely chilling, which was that she had confided in him once that she lived in fear of the house. She refused to go in the attic as it terrified her, she died several years before we moved, but one of the most chilling things was that once she passed, the house was completely renovated. The attics turned into rooms, as I mentioned. The flower beds Mrs. Evans had so much pride in were torn up and everything just changed. The work was mostly done by one guy who had been hired to do so by the local council who inherited the house as Mrs. Evans had no family to speak of. And just days after he'd finished up the renovation, his daughter died in a freak lightning accident. I personally have no idea if it's tied to this. It is terribly unfortunate either way, but the neighbor seemed to think that whatever was in that house certainly did not take kindly to it being changed and decided to take revenge. That is just hearsay, mind you, but it's a bit strange nevertheless. What I do believe, though, is that there were several entities in that house, including possibly Mrs. Evans herself, but the strongest residing in the attic, for sure. I felt things up there that I have since never encountered anywhere ever again. A genuine feeling of just something evil, something that wants to hurt you. I can't even recall how many times people were seemingly pushed when going down the stairs from that attic too, or whenever my cat, who was usually the most lovely boy, was near those stairs, he would viciously attack you with no explanation for his outburst. The whole house had, like, its moments. It was in a sort of constant state of darkness and bitter cold, but the attic? I don't even have the words to describe what that was. We finally moved when I was 11, though, and... As if by magic, the nightmares just completely disappeared. I could finally sleep easy, and well, we've moved several times since then, in fact, and I've never encountered a house like that before. Honestly, I haven't had any paranormal experiences that I can think of since being in that house, but that's just fine with me, because it was enough for a lifetime, let me tell you. I do think that it will always be with me, though. Sometimes I'll have the most vivid dreams that I'm back there and I'm so glad to be there, and almost as if it's calling me back or something. I have so many stories of just creepy things happening, so much so that something like this would take several hours to explain, but I think that this is more than enough to make me feel spooked recounting it all. For a little bit of background, I no longer live on the same property, but this particular house always gave me bad vibes, and I had a few very minor paranormal experiences I would shake off as coincidence or imagination, but I've always felt a connection to the paranormal, even as a kid, which, if this does well, I'll give you some more experiences of mine some other time. So, a few years ago in my old house, I had been struggling to sleep for a while, and on this particular night, I had been reading pretty late, I would say around 2am, and I needed to get up to go to the bathroom. My room was very small, basically a glorified walk-in closet, despite the house being quite large. It was on the second floor in a long hallway. 
so in order to get to the bathroom I had to pass the stairwell but I had no issues whilst going there. When I washed my hands though I distinctly remember how cold the room was and that the water had a slight brown tinge to it, dirty even, and was running very well but I didn't pay much mind to it I suppose. I was living with my parents at the time so I would get my dad to look at it in the morning. On my way back, just as I was passing the staircase, I then heard my mum call out to me from downstairs, saying, Harry, come downstairs, me and dad have a new laptop for you. Now, I have no idea why, but sheer dread just flooded my body. I started trembling as the temperature dropped suddenly, but I also started sweating. For some reason, the only thing running through my head was that, that's not my mother, and if I go down there... I'm going to die. It wasn't that this voice sounded like my mother. It was my mother's voice, as if it had borrowed or something. I don't know. But I took off down the hall and into the bedroom like a child. I have no idea what would have happened to me if I went downstairs, but I'm glad that I didn't. I asked both my mother and my father about it a couple of days afterwards. I was afraid to even acknowledge that it happened, to be honest. And both denied it ever happening, and... They gave me a very odd look of concern. It was one of the more intense experiences that I didn't initiate myself, but I'll be happy to share other experiences of mine, so just let me know if you want to hear more. I've also noticed a shadow man and shadow people flare that opens up a whole can of worms from my childhood that I shared with my mum, and it's crazy to see that it's actually so common here on the internet. But again, I'll leave that for another time.